been going all morning. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're ready. George, as soon as I see the live button coming up in front of me, I will start to speak and introduce the chair. You put the thumbs up and tell me when to start. Keith, the event's yeah. live. Thank you. So welcome to this ICE joint with SIWEM 18th National Flood Conference, Management and Resilience. For the first time, this event is virtual. First of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors, which are Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales, and sponsored by SNC Labbing, Atkins, Waterco, Arab, JBA Consulting and Black and Beach. Special thanks to George Baker for running the IT. So before we pass over to the Minister, I'd like to introduce our chair for the first session, which is Yvonne Murphy. Yvonne is a senior civil engineer and design leader at McDonald and chair of IC Wales Cymru. Yvonne. Thanks very much, Keith. Um, so for people new to this environment, I think it's uh, we're just getting used to it now. Uh, Microsoft Teams. This is Microsoft Teams Live. Um, so the event is being broadcast as a live event, which means that um, George uh, Baker behind the scenes is going to um, put up the different presenters as um, as their slots come to speak. And if there's any hiccups along the way, please forgive us. We're, we're getting we're getting used to this. Um, there's a three hour programme, as you're aware, and we're going to try hard to keep to time and take questions at um, set points. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A box. You'll see pop up on your right hand side of the screen. And if you could like the questions that uh, if somebody else posts one that you're really keen to get an answer for, I'll try and prioritise the, the ones with the most likes to get answers first. And at the end of the session, um, we'll um, have a time for a quick break before we go back to session two and hopefully we'll all run to programme. Um, and in order to do so, I'll very quickly uh, introduce. Um, so good morning, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 18th Wales National Flooding Conference. This conference is organised by IC Wales Cymru in partnership with the Chartered Institution of Water and Environment Management. Uh, the event is supported by the Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales with sponsorship from Arup, Atkins, Black & Veatch, JBA Consulting, Smart Flood Management in partnership with Waterco and Welsh Government. Without their support and sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to run this conference. So thank you very much again to our sponsors. I see Wales um, Cymru is keenly aware that for Wales, flooding and flood risk management is particularly relevant and topical. The flooding events across the UK and in Wales year on year appear to be indicative of climate change and therefore looking to the future, flooding is likely to become increasingly prevalent. Without appropriate flood risk planning and management, there can be serious and indeed tragic consequences to flooding. It's important for us as experts to inform the Welsh public of these consequences and to be strong advocates for the best methods of flood risk management. We must change the way the flooding is viewed. We here in Wales must ensure that the people of Wales are adequately informed of flood risk and prevention and mitigation measures that can effectively plan for the possibility of flooding. Now, I would like you to warmly welcome Leslie Griffiths, a Minister for Environment, Energy and Rural Affairs, and my grateful thanks to her for supporting our event and speaking today, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, and thank you for inviting me to open this year's National Flood Conference. I think it's uh, very safe to say that 2020 has been an extremely challenging year for us all. And not only have we found ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic, but we've witnessed one of the worst years for flooding on record. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking all those involved in the response and the recovery efforts uh, to the flood events we've had throughout the year. Without the swift action of NRW, uh, local authorities and our emergency services, I am certain we would have seen many more homes flooded and loss of life. The rainfall and river levels that led to the February floods were exceptional. NRW will be covering the scale of these storms in more detail later on. The flooding this year has directly affected over 3,000 homes and businesses across the country, and my sympathies go to those who've been flooded. I witnessed firsthand the devastating impact of these floods when I visited Pontypridd, Crickhowell, Llanroost, Llanhilleth, uh, Bangrondi and Tylerstown in February. I met with residents and business owners who've been affected, as well as many responders and volunteers who were helping offer support and respite. The community spirit that I saw was absolutely humbling. It was striking how people who'd lost everything were pulling together and still trying to help others, doing their best to recover 
and apologising for not being able to offer me a cup of tea. Knowing how those communities then had to deal with COVID-19 restrictions is heartbreaking and has strengthened my resolve to do everything our government can do to help reduce the risk of further flooding. The flooding highlights the significance of our ongoing flood and coastal investment programmes in protecting lives, homes and businesses. I've been hugely impressed at how contractors working with our local authorities in NRW have been able to progress flood projects and repair work despite the restrictions imposed by the pandemic, recognising the importance of delivering such schemes and reducing risk of life. Following these flood events, we work closely with NRW and our local authorities to understand the impact and provide financial support to make urgent repairs to damaged assets, not just restoring original levels of protection, but making improvements where possible. I have provided 100% grant funding for this work totaling £4.3 million pounds to date. This is in addition to the £1.2 million pounds provided directly to homeowners to help them recover. However, this is only the start. Local authorities have submitted their applications to Welsh Government for flood recovery costs, amounting to more than £100 million pounds over the next four years, and that includes uh, coal tip remediation costs. And discussions between the Welsh Government and the UK Government regarding the funding of these recovery costs are ongoing. We must acknowledge how climate change is making these events more frequent. With this comes the acknowledgement we cannot stop all flooding. However, we can continue to reduce risk through the better management of land and water. There is no one way to manage risk. We will have to adapt and manage flood risk more effectively. This may mean better defences in some of our communities, and we should not shy away from the need to build new schemes and improve our current network of assets. However, this does not necessarily mean high walls. We must make space for water, use the natural environment to manage risk and plan effectively. This could include moving defences back, building flood attenuation areas, holding water back in the upper catchments and slowing the rate it enters our rivers and streams. In all cases, we will improve how we communicate risk, help communities understand the risk that they face and involve them in the decisions which will affect them. Adapting to climate change is not something to do in the next few years. We must be considering this in all our activities now. In recovering from flood events such as those witnessed this year, we should consider whether the existing defences remain fit for purpose. Their standard of protection may no longer be what it was when constructed, and developments upstream may have significantly added to runoff and peak flow. We must consider a range of approaches to not only repair like for like, but to adapt both our communities and our infrastructure so they are better prepared for future flood events and rising sea levels. We want residents to take more responsibility and make their homes more resilient. But this adaptive resilience or build back better approach also applies to infrastructure and the way we plan our towns and cities. I want to ensure our investment is considering climate change and building future adaptation into schemes. The ongoing work at East Rill is an example of this and has been designed to allow further improvements later in the century to keep pace with sea level rise. In April this year, I announced significant changes to our flood and coastal programme to provide additional support to risk management authorities and to accelerate delivery of flood and coastal defence schemes. I'm now providing 100% funding for all preparatory work towards future flood schemes. In doing this, I want to create a much stronger pipeline of future investments so we can plan ahead effectively over the next decade. I've already increased the grant rate for the construction of all coastal schemes to 85%. This commitment recognises the national importance of our coastal programme and the challenges we are already facing from sea level rise and increased storminess. I've introduced a new natural flood management programme, again providing 100% funding for all such projects over the next two years. To date, we've received and agreed applications to the value of over £2.4 million. A condition of this funding is close monitoring and reporting back to Welsh Government so we can share evidence and good practice. This will help us learn more about what works well in different landscapes 
and to promote and refine approaches that deliver the greatest benefit. I want Wales to lead the way with this work, and this is reflected in our new national strategy. Alongside an ambitious capital programme, I was also pleased to be able to provide record, record levels of revenue funding to NRW and local authorities this year to support in the delivery of this programme. The increase in funding levels over the life of this government, despite austerity measures and reductions elsewhere, plus the extra support announced this year, reflect the importance we place on flood and coastal risk management. I want this to continue over the next government term. The Welsh Government's ambition is always to provide as much early certainty as possible regarding spending plans and multi-year settlements, which will help us all plan more effectively. However, we do not yet know when the UK Government's spending review will conclude, and until it does, I am limited as to what I can say on future allocations. The improvements I made to the Flood and Coastal Programme were planned to come alongside the new national strategy. I introduced them sooner in recognition of the urgent support required in response to the flooding and to accelerate delivery of new schemes and essential maintenance work wherever it was required. Our new national strategy for flood and coastal risk management in Wales has been prepared with the help of many of you listening today and was approved by Cabinet over the summer, allowing us to lay it in the Senate. I will be publishing the new national strategy next week on the 20th of October and can set out today some of the changes it incorporates. The new strategy is a significant step up in our approach to managing flood and coastal erosion risk. It is far clearer on roles and responsibilities and sets out new objectives on prevention, preparedness and better communication of risk. Through a comprehensive set of measures, the strategy also encourages more natural flood management and greater collaboration to further reduce risk and create better, more sustainable schemes which will deliver wider well-being benefits. It is an ambitious uh, strategy and reaffirms the importance we place on flood risk management and the growing risks associated with climate change. Our strategy is quite different from England, whose policies are set out across two separate documents with an action plan to come in in 2021. We set out in one place the overarching government policy, as well as the actions and measures we will take over the next decade to reduce flood and coastal risk. We hope this will make our strategy more accessible. We want the public to see what we are doing, as well as giving clear direction to our risk management authorities. As I've already said, we are seeing the impacts of climate change now and the consequence on people's lives as well as our economy and infrastructure. We've incorporated emerging lessons from earlier this year and have reinforced our commitments on flood prevention, enhanced resilience and adaptation. Flood and coastal risk management is more than just the building of defences. We are ensuring there is better provision of information, greater collaboration and partnership working. It also has a strong focus on natural flood management and catchment approaches. We want to see creative, more sustainable schemes which deliver wider benefits, leading to improved well-being, mental health and a more prosperous Wales. This strategy strengthens our stance on prevention and links with new Welsh legislation and other policy areas to ensure we do not store up problems for future generations. Our new direction on sustainable drainage and forthcoming changes to planning policy complement this strategy and ensure a consistent national approach to the management of land and water. It has been developed alongside a new technical advice note, CAM 15, to ensure our flood, coastal and planning policies align, taking into account better information to avoid inappropriate development and provide clear advice in our new flood map. The new flood risk assessment for Wales is being launched alongside the strategy. For the first time, this will show flood risk from all sources of risk and incorporate information on shoreline management and our national asset database. It will maximise the impact of our investment with updates every six months, showing how our flood schemes have reduced risk, helping to bring down the cost of people's insurance and providing peace of mind to those communities. 
the map will continue to improve and will incorporate coastal erosion risk data in the near future. This will be joined by a new flood map for planning early next year, which will help make better, more informed decisions on development and incorporate surface water data for the first time to provide a more complete understanding of risk. The strategy recognises how flood risk management cannot work in isolation. It is a cross-cutting plan, which looks wider and far beyond its 10-year timeframe, to not only reduce the risk we have today, but prevent poor decisions being made now, which will affect future generations. There remain difficult challenges ahead. We are working closely with communities at increasing risk to establish how they can remain safe in the short term, but also plan for adaptation in the next 50 years. We will put our communities first and involve them every step of the way. Finally, I want the strategy to spark conversation about how we manage flood risk. We are delivering more than ever in this space with record levels of investment, but we cannot stop all flooding. These are difficult discussions on how we manage risk and prioritise our resources. But with more attention than ever in this area, they are not conversations we will shy away from. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to open your conference. I hope you have a very successful event. I'm sorry I'm not able to uh, stay with you any longer due to cabinet and plenary uh, commitments, but I have two officials on this call, Andy Fraser and James Morris, who are happy to take any observations, comments or questions you may have. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, so we have um, about 10 minutes now for Q&A. There's a few questions that have started to come through already. Um, if we could introduce James Morris and Andy Fraser. So they've just popped up on my screen now. So uh, good morning all. Good morning. Hello. Um, so our first question here was, well, it's the most popular question as well, is um, the Environment Agency are moving away from defence and protection to adaption and resilience. And is this something that we should be reflecting in Wales? I think uh, just the first thing to say from, from myself, Andy, uh, just by way of introduction, is it helpful if we introduce ourselves, Yvonne, for all the attendees? Yeah. Um, great, yeah. Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm Andy Fraser. I'm uh, the Deputy Director of Water and Flood in, in Welsh Government. So uh, my responsibilities cover all that that entails, including uh, the new uh, the First Minister's new programme on coal tip safety. So everything that, that relates to water and flood and, and, and that agenda. And uh, I'm joined uh, by James as well. Hello, everyone. So I'm James Morris, I'm Head of Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management at Welsh Government. So it covers the, the programme, policy and strategy and resilience and response matters as well. So I think Yvonne, just, just a, a couple of remarks from, for, uh, from me before uh, I, I allowed James to, to comment further on the, on the detail. In terms of that question, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm not quite sure where, where the evidence is, is, is for the EA moving away from uh, protection itself. I mean, I, I think I would say in terms of our longer term approach, which is set out in the strategy, as the minister uh, referred to uh, in, in her opening address. I mean, I, I think we we are taking a blended approach through our five uh, strategic objectives here. We We are not we are not moving away from uh, protection and resilience here. We are very concerned about the, making sure that we're doing everything we can uh, with effective use and prioritised use of resources to protect communities as far as we are able against uh, uh, against flood risk. So that means protecting communities, protecting properties, but that notwithstanding that we're, we're thinking very carefully about the longer term and looking to do as much as possible by future proofing, uh, our, our future proofing flood, flood protection measures so that you know we are considering the longer term, the impact of, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, Im impacts of climate change, sea level rise, coastal erosion, the, the incidence of higher intensity rainfall that can lead to greater surface water and, and pluvial flooding. So I'd, I'd say we're certainly take, we're, we're taking a blended approach on, on that front. James. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I think, it, you know, what we have in, in Wales and, and as well in England as well and across the rest of the UK, it, it's a one size fits all approach. Um, and I think the question is, um, you know, saying EA and moving away from defences and protection. 
they're not. They're also working on defences and protection alongside adaptation, resilience, and so are we. I mean, it was uh, shared with me recently how England, uh, our Dublin investment, capital investment in, in flood risk management, and I think the figures uh, I've seen are something like 5.2 billion on capital investment uh, up until about 2026, 2027 to better protect over 300,000 properties. So, so England are not, I, I'm standing up for England here, I should be talking about Wales, but England are not purely going down, uh, you know, a, a look after yourself approach there. It's, as in Wales, it's a blended approach, as Andy said. Um, and, and, you know, this is demonstrated, I think the minister started to talk about prevention and protection, but she also talked about natural flood management, um, climate change adaptation, what we're doing, which we're making things easier to bring forward those type of schemes, those sort of wider wellbeing benefits that come with that kind of approach as well. And it, it's it's not all around uh, about walls and, and concrete, obviously, and it, it hasn't been for, for many years now. The flood risk management approach is much wider than that. Um, and we're making this sort of much, much clearer in the strategy as well, which is why we're trying to push more around better communication of risk so people can take responsibility for themselves as well. Thanks very much both. I, I suppose it is horses for courses really and um, having all of the data in one place is, is a great way to make an informed decision about where uh, what best measures are appropriate. Um, so the next question is the money question. Unfortunately it always gets asked. Um, so the pipeline um, for delivery of defences, multi-year financial settlements will make uh, such a difference if we as infrastructure are able to deliver better value. Um, what needs to happen for this to be implemented across Wales and can it happen by the 31st of March next year? For me to go first this time, Andy. Well, I, I, I was the only thing I would say about this is that uh, uh, this is a, re a really important issue for us, and you know the minister referred to it in 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 her her remarks. You know, we we are always going to focus on looking to provide as much certainty as possible in relation to spending plans, so that we can we can give that cert certainty and confidence to. Wells' is flood risk management authorities. You know, we would like to set out clear spending plans through multi-year settlements, but the problem that we have is that we don't know what the outcome of the UK government comprehensive spending review will will be. Uh, and until we do, until we do, we won't know uh, we, we won't know the number of years over what it will cover, or what our settlement for the the wider Welsh government pot, as it were, will be will be for beyond 2021, 2022. So that is a key issue here. But I think it's a no brainer in terms of our commitment to flood risk management. The strategy sets it out clearly. You know, I, I think it's it's clearly an area where any administration would want to be focusing attention and investment. Um, we're hoping that the comprehensive spending review will will bring some clarity to our uh, the, the wider financial position. But, uh, you know, speculation that the Chancellor can, may undertake a single review, so we don't really know where, where that will be. We'll have, to, we'll have to follow that. And of course, overarching all of this, we've got the, the issues around surrounding EU exit, which also cuts into, uh, in, into the financial position, as does, of course, the ongoing uh, response to the coronavirus pa pandemic. So, you know, we'll, we're following things very closely. We'll, we work closely with our colleagues in Welsh Treasury to, to make sure that we're in touch with the, the, on, the, the, the evolution of, of these discussions. But we have set out quite clearly, you know, what our intentions are, what our ambitions are through the strategy. Thank you. I, I suppose as well, there's um, a lot more emphasis on partnership working coming out of NRW's policy for sustainable management of natural resources. And um, George has added as well that the new flood risk policy and draft for the National Development Framework suggests new opportunities for partnership working. Could you expand on how you see this working in Wales? We've got um, strong policies in, our, in the forthcoming national strategy. So we do want to encourage more partnership funding. We want to see those wider wellbeing benefits. So it's not necessarily just from other risk management authorities, we want to look wider to get money in from others who benefit as well. So there's a clear policy and a measure on that in the strategy, as uh, there is on um, a better pipeline as well. As Andy said, this is something we all want and we're looking towards a five to maybe hopefully a 10 year um, pipeline. And that will help us to, to make a better case for those longer term um, allocations as well. So it's a two way thing here. We all want longer term allocations, but we need to be able to demonstrate that too. And a better pipeline and a longer pipeline will help us to do that. 
Great. There's a, a couple of questions here from the transportation sector as well. So Network Rail and Transport for Wales uh, own and operate the rail network in Wales. Much of this infrastructure is built on floodplain or adjacent to estuary and river or coastal areas. And there's great opportunity to make use of these existing national assets. So nobody argues there um, to the advantage. Um, and I suppose there's the strategy and other means of, of making that happen. So I'm just reading through that now. Is this popping up as well? <laughs> Very long question. It There's a couple is. related ones and uh, because they're popular, I think they're hopping up on my list. So I get to finish one before I get to the next one. Um, Railway infrastructure forms a, a really important part. Um, but there's there's a careful balance here um, about how they are recognised, you know, as infrastructure assets or flood risk management assets. And, and they don't always want their infrastructure to be recognised as such, although we recognise that they do play a part of that of, of that role. Um, and there's there's what we want to do is have more discussions with the likes of Network Rail um, and transport colleagues about how we can better utilise our, our you know, infrastructure together so that when there's work done on, on rail network, we can go in at the same time and make sure that flood defences are bolstered, you know, maybe um, spend a little bit less money and a have a little bit less um, disruption to residents nearby in, in going in once, not two or three times. Um, it's, it's, there's an awful lot of, of third party assets around Wales, not just rail infrastructure. And a challenge for us is actually getting to grips with the ownership, the maintenance regime, and, and whether we need to um, recognise them as flood structures, you know, adopt them as such and, um, and designate them as such, because that makes a bit of a difference as well. There's powers that we have available to us to do so. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question as well about, about um, stakeholder involvement, I suppose. Um, with the impending changes to TAN 15, what duties do you intend to place on local planning authorities to consider flood risk? Is there a better way of integrating them? Um, I, I can't really sort of say too much about TAN 15 yet. Um, what we've done, we've prepared the national strategy alongside the changes to TAN 15. The, the duties which remain on local planning authorities and lead local flood authorities will remain the same. But what we're going to do is make it uh, easier and, and provide a little bit more help to those local planning authorities. So what they, when they do want to say no, when they have to say no to, some, uh, to, to a development in a floodplain or in, in high risk flood areas, the policy, the strategy, the planning policy and the national flood str uh, strategy, they'll be very clear and this will probably help our, our you know, um, uh, not just our, our planners, but it, it, when things are called in for ministers as well, we need to have that kind of real clear policy background to say that this isn't acceptable. You know, this kind of line in the sand has been drawn. And I think the new TAN 15 is going to make that a little bit easier for, for everybody to see what, what is allowed, what's not allowed. It'll be a bit tougher on, on vulnerable developments, homes in medium and high risk floodplains. But there might be a more pragmatic approach when it comes to developments in a much lower risk. Um, so it's not this kind of, you know, broad brush approach about um, zone C where, you know, anything within a one in a thousand has a certain type of uh, policy targeted at it. This is going to be a little bit more, you know, pragmatic and a bit more approachable in those one in 800, one in 900, where the risk may be able to be managed, but tougher where it's one in 30, one in 50 or anything greater than one in 100. That, I think, will make the lives easier for our officials and local planning authorities and the planning inspectorate when it's called into. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here about how do we support coastal communities to adapt to climate change with set out in the shoreline management plans and how will that be funded and who makes the decision? Um, I'll go first on this one again. Andy can, can, can come in on this if he wants to as well. The, the, Ultimately, you know, the local authority needs to look after its residents and they will be, as a risk management authority, looking at what interventions need to be brought through, as will NRW. But we want to be able to support those communities. We want to be able to make it clear that their support will be there. So um, the strategy talks about coastal adaptation in, in, in some depth and about how even though those decisions are therefore to be locally made, because we can't have one policy for every coastal town or community, every area will be different and there'll be different approaches just as the shoreline management plans, you know, state. Um, but th that funding is there to help keep those residents safe in the short to medium term, but also we want them to, to plan ahead and adapt. So some of our coastal towns, um, one in particular, which is quite commonly in the, in the, uh, in the headlines, 
is facing up to challenges, which is going to be there in, in the next 50 or 60 years. And we're working with residents and the local plan and uh, local authority um, to prepare for that. So the residents feel safe for the time being, but they know that there's a phased approach and they know what we're working towards because there will come a time where it may be unviable to keep those residents and those homes safe. And we want to make sure that everybody is prepared and there's a way forward way, way beyond that stage. We want to, um, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a case of leaving anyone behind. The support will remain there. It comes through the risk management authorities. We don't give the funding directly to, to, to residents itself at the moment. But, um, you know, the support and ministers made very, very clear the support for, for those coastal towns is there, but we need them to also prepare plans for the future. Yvonne, I'd just, just like to in, endorse what James was saying there. The only other point I'd, I'd add, add is that, you know, the Welsh Government is, you know, supporting those those conversations with communities and we have done for some time. The other aspect of this is the role of the public service boards brought in under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. I think public service boards with their, their focus on wellbeing for future generations have a key role to play in this. They bring those key partners around the table, including Welsh Government, but the uh, but but at that local tier as as well. And I think that those the public service boards have a, a key role to play in that communication and decision making process for the future as well. Great, thank you very much. I think we've time for one last question, and hopefully it's an easy one. Uh, it was stated that funds are being provided to support NFM. Um, can you advise where these funds are being directed? Is it through NRW or local river trusts? The funds are being directed through the risk management authorities. So there is um, two million pounds. I think 2.4 million pounds of applications have come in uh, for us this year um, for this new NFM programme. So far, all schemes have been agreed, accepted as well. So that 2.4 million will be rolled out um, over the next two years. There's still scope for more funding um, on this for next year as well. Um, but uh, as with normal flood schemes, it's directed through our risk management authority. So we, we want them to work in partnership with others as well. Though. So, you know, they might be the ones who bring forward um, the scheme and whether the funding is directed through. But there's no reason why they, they can't work with ind individual landowners and other third parties too. Great. Thanks both. Um, I will draw this session to a close then for the Q&A and we'll start our next speaker if I can. So I think Gwyn is, is ready and waiting and I'll just give him a brief introduction. Um, thank you very much, um, Andy and James. Thanks, um, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Keith. Well done, uh, so Gwyn, um, Gwyn is joining us on behalf of the Wales Coastal Monitoring Centre and uh, he's going to speak to us about um, the introduction to the Wales Coastal Monitoring Centre and uh, a little bit about his experience. Uh, he obtained a degree in marine geography from Cardiff University in 2003. After travelling and working abroad for a year, he joined Titan Environmental Surveys as an assistant hydrographer. Uh, he's gained five years survey experience as for developing into a project manager and providing business support over the following eight years. He's worked on 101 projects, uh, including topographic, hydrographic, oceanographic, marine mammal and water quality uh, from running international surveys as a party chief. Gwyn has moved into the office and developed the business integrated management system complying with OHAS ISO standards for Q QH. SE and other responsibilities has included tender management, human resource management, business strategy and marketing support. So I'll take a deep breath now and off you go Gwyn. Thank you Yvonne. Um, yeah, hello everybody, uh, I'm Gwyn Nelson. I am the programme manager at the New Wales Coastal Monitoring Centre. I've been given this opportunity to tell you about what we've been up to over the last year or so. So I've got some slides. I'll just try and share my screen. Here we go. Uh, start the slideshow. Are we live with slides? I'm going to assume we are. Great. OK, so thank you. Firstly, this is a proud new logo. I was delighted with it until a few weeks ago when Professor Williams suggested our dragon look more like an albino werewolf. Uh, thank you, Alan. The werewolf can't be unseen. I'd like to start with a special thank you to Clive Moon, the Vailable Morgan Council and Jean-Francois Dulong, whose generous support and knowledge has been key to this, our progress to date. Um, just skip over that slide. This is my presentation plan, so the who, what, when, etc. If you follow these icons, you'll be able to track how we progress through the presentation. 
So as an introduction, the Wales Coastal Monitoring Centre are 100% funded by the Welsh Government from the Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Budget. We're obviously a public sector organisation and report to the consortium of the Vale of Glamorgan, Gwyneth and Conway Councils and the WLGA. We're hosted in the Vale of Glamorgan Council. We have an advisory panel and our delivery team includes local authority surveyors and contractors. Our data is hosted by the Channel Coastal Observatory, who have historically supplied coastal data to consultants and lo local authorities, uh, and we've integrated that data map into our own website. Um, and let's not forget the most important item missing off this organogram. Of course, we're here to serve the people of Wales, which is always at the forefront of our minds. <coughs> um, our resources increased by 50% a few weeks ago. We started a new undergraduate 12 month work placement scheme and we took on Maya. Uh, Will started last year graduating with a master's in applied marine science. Both members of the team are more intelligent than me and super eager. Uh, the only problem working with such a young team is you always look like the tired one. I have 14 years commercial tour experience of which 10 years was in project management and business organisational management. So this is our very clear and useful aim. Uh, the key points being a national approach to collecting the evidence base required to support flooding coastal erosion risk management decisions. Uh, and what do we do? Well, we manage contractors. We're increasing data quality and decreasing the survey cost. We also help train maritime local authority survey teams for the coastal environment, uh, and we make all of this data available. We've developed our own values. Uh, firstly, we consistently deliver high quality data to build trust with stakeholders and be dependable. I'll talk a bit about our specifications later. Secondly, as a small team to achieve more, we seek to collaborate with others as much as possible, public sector and commercial, we don't mind. Um, and we look to technological advancements for efficiencies. Thirdly, an evidence-based approach requires empirical methods. So we measure to ensure our decisions are informed and we seek to remove conjecture in everything we do. Fourth, this can be the easiest to roll off your tongue as a management buzzword, but is actually the hardest. To take the time for the people that you work with daily, to support them in the way they learn best, especially during these difficult adapting times. Um, we need the flexibility and understanding from our teams. Fifth, inspired by the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, with all of our work, we ask how can others benefit from what we do? So timeline, uh, Will and I started at the Vale last year, having two full-time staff as input significant resources allowed the groundwork supporting our program development. Prior to us starting, uh, Clive got the ball rolling by procuring initial beach surveys and, and MCA collaborating bathymetric surveys. Um, and further to 2021, we seek more funding to build on the foundations of the put in place. Why are we doing this? Uh, you've all seen the stats for Wales. Uh, we're, we're blessed with a long and beautiful coastline in Wales. People have been historically drawn to live on it for their livelihood and lifestyle, which leaves us with a challenge. Um, the famous Porth Gall photos. There's a growing pressure on our urban coastline. We have diverse geology in Wales, some being very active, some of the highest tides in the world, oceanic wave exposure, important infrastructure and exposure to storms of an ever increasing intensity and frequency, plus growing public awareness of climate change. Um, talking of the wave exposure, I've got a quick pub quiz, pub quiz question for everyone. I got this wrong. So listen in. To where is the furthest distance over water from the Welsh coastline? So the fetch, effectively. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. The answer is nearly 14,000 kilometres to the Antarctic from Pembrokeshire. Um, I had to fact check this. Myself. But if you look at the map on the top left, there we go, Pembrokeshire down to the Antarctic. I thought that was interesting. You don't get much bigger fetches than that. Um, so this is a national problem. 
Previously, local authorities have had funding for data collection to support features within their boundaries. Postal processes aren't restricted by local authority boundaries. When local authority decides to add a groin, this can impact the settlement movement in a neighbouring local authority. And so a more strategic evidence base is required. Um, so moving on to the how, all of the points that we've mentioned impact how and what we monitor. We've used the existing shoreline management plans as the fundamental basis for our work. Taking each policy unit as a survey unit and using the shoreline management plan recommendations in our risk-based methodology, or RBM, the RBM is the key driver behind our survey program. Um, so this is the RBM, which is based on work done within the Channel Coast Observatory. We scored each policy unit or survey unit for risk. So to do this, we looked at the existing policy um, from the Shoreline Management Plan, hold the line through to no active intervention. We scored the future recommended policies. We looked at assets, the anthropogenic socioeconomic risk from coastal flood and erosion impacts. We did a property and infrastructure count. Uh, we used the National Receptor Database. We looked at erosion and used the National Coastal Erosion Risk Model erosion rates to score. Um, and then for beach behavior, in the absence of years of consistent pan whales data on the coast, we have the future coast beach width data which predicts shoreline evolution. Um, in this image, you can see the mumbles. Uh, the blue surface here represents the NRW tidal flood risk model, one in 200 year event. Um, this gives you an indication of how we went on the coastline and counted up the properties and infrastructure at risk of flood. And this brown line is a 50 metre buffer above the high water line, which we use to count uh, properties at risk of erosion. Um, so moving on, this is the Pam Wales view of our first risk based methodology. Um, the topography of Wales is shown giving an indication of low lying land. The cloud shadow you can see is actually a population heat map. So the white coastline is the low risk and the dark red is the high risk. You take note on the borders with England, North and South Wales, um, both areas are high risk. Uh, we have high populations, low lying land, which is in contrast to say Pembrokeshire or the Sheen Peninsula, which have low populations and high fairly stable cliffs. So we also worked on our specification, which ensures data methods, accuracies, processing and deliverables are the same across Wales. And we encourage any additional coastal data that might be collected by risk management authorities or consultants to please use our specification so that all data sets can integrate together. And of course, they integrate into the Channel Coastal Observatory program too. Um, the standardization was also pushed out into analysis and reporting, which will be comparable across political boundaries. The examples here show some seasonal profiles um, and surface analysis from repeat surveys. We've had to consider designated protected areas, so we had a lot of help from Nikki Rimmington at NRW. Uh, we reviewed and applied for a sense for survey operations at all designated protected Welsh coastal sites making it easier for our contractors to protect the environment that we work in. All of this needed to be considered to build our survey program. So based on the risk based methodology, we then assessed how many survey units can we actually access. Um, and then we reduced all these scores into manageable categories. We built a cost model which was based on market costs from previously procured surveys um, and then applied our budget to determine uh, frequencies uh, and densities of surveys at, at varying risk locations. So this is what our survey locations look like. Again, red is the high risk. Um, notice for the borders with England, as I mentioned earlier, which were high risk areas aren't included so that we basically can't access them with terrestrial survey methods and our budget doesn't extend to aerial methods. So we currently have a gap in some high risk sites here. Yeah. Um, in terms of progress, uh, we've had some issues with COVID this year, which obviously delayed some surveys um, with lockdown, but we've, we've just about caught up. Um, and of course, the beach is probably one of the safest working environments uh, to be on, so the approach is improving. 
We're currently on track, having achieved an equivalent of 32% of Welsh coastal frontage. This is what that looks like on a map on the left. So the green areas are the beach surveys that we've completed. The blue areas are seafloor bathymetric surveys um, collected in collaboration with the MCA, uh, which the data sets overlap with our beach data. And on the right, this is off our website, our data portal, where all the data is freely available that you can come and collect, uh, collect and download. So as well as building and working on our program, we've started a number of collaborations. We've done trials with drone. We've worked with the MCA to collect offshore sediment budgets. We've trialled mobile laser scanning equipment. This is, belongs to Adder and Worthing Council. This is a, a high tech uh, equipment on ATV. Um, we've then incorporated similar ideas. So the British Geological Survey have got a mobile um, mobile laser scanning backpack and they kindly came down to do a trial survey of Tembi. So this is actually a data set that you're looking at. Um, but we adapted it from a quad bike onto an e-trike with snow tires, which is a, a lot cheaper. It's actually pretty quick and works, works really well. So we were pleased with that. Um, we worked with a company called Unmanned Survey Solutions who wanted to trial their new autonomous vessels. So this vessel and this vessel over here, they're separate companies, but they're, they're both uh, autonomous. They drive on their own or can be remotely operated. Uh, Unmanned Survey Solutions did a survey of Conway bridges for scour, so they were able to look at the seabed with the transducer and the mobile laser scanner, which is the structure of the bridge above the surface at the same time and build up a 3D point cloud. Um, other collaborations, so we've recently won funding for a master's placement in the robotics department at Aberystwyth University. The aim is to develop a low cost autonomous vehicle to survey beaches and make it available for all. This is viable due to cheap survey grade receivers being developed by drone companies. Um, it has the potential to reach the inaccessible frontage by mini unmanned hovercraft currently not being done. Um, it would increase the productivity because you can send out multiple drones with one surveyor uh, or, or rovers. It would remove the need for a quad bike uh, potentially and reduce our impact on the environment. And it, it improves the safety by removing people from the intertidal zone uh, and their risks of water exposure. Um, and we have the potential to increase our tidal windows by allowing surveys in the dark, which are currently not safe to do. Uh, we've also collaborated with Coastal Marine Applied Research at Plymouth University, who they kindly found funding to develop their flood forecast warning system to include South Wales. They were currently doing southwest of England, um, but it wasn't a lot of extra work to include the South Wales coastline. Uh, their model updates with our latest beach profiles that we collect. Uh, it also sucks in Met Office and real-time waveboy data to give free overtopping forecasts to any locations that you choose to sign up to. Um, on the bottom right map we can see here the areas in yellow are the areas which have just been released this week. Um, we'll look to verify how accurate the forecasts are and we'll add more profile data to build up the locations that people can access. Um, we're working with universities as much as we can. We've been helping undergraduate dissertations and have started our undergraduate placement scheme to give opportunities to potential flood and coastal erosion risk management enthusiasts. Um, so we've worked with Swansea, Cardiff, Aberystwyth, Bristol and Plymouth students so far. <coughs> so in other collaborations, um, we've got some pictures here from our schools, schools program, which is being developed with Barry Island Primary School on coast and climate change. The 14 lesson program is being created to the new national curriculum. We'd like all the schools on the program to try and connect with an international school and share climate change stories and experiences. Uh, the bottom right is Matt Fower Elementary School in American Samoa, who shared experiences with Tana Revel in RCT. Um, I was most pleased when I read the school's external seven year inspection report, quote, by year six, many pupils debate topical subjects articulately, such as climate change. So that was a great job then, I think. Um, and a huge thank you to Miss Leah Phillips for her time and passion on that project. As part of this program, we've been using Google Cardboard to build accessible, cheap virtual reality case studies. 
across Wales and the globe. Um, I'd like to give a massive thank you to Professor Alan Williams for creating and facilitating most of the case studies, including international university contributions. We've had Sydney, Colombia, the Netherlands, Italy, and American Samoa, of course. Um, and these case studies couldn't be more valuable at a time when schools can't travel or go on school trips. So looking ahead, uh, we've got plenty of data finalising to do from our own collaborations and trials. We'd like to do a full stakeholder assessment, assessment and set up required reporting systems when our analysis of the data starts pouring out. We're currently working on business case, our business case and considering the following options. We'd like to move to longer cycles uh, for increased savings. We want to increase the data frequency to better inform FSUM decisions. We'd like to address the high risk inaccessible frontage, possibly with LIDAR. Um, and if the operational wave and water level forecast proves valuable, possibly consider extending it for Wales. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for listening and giving me your time. Um, thank you to all those listed below for their support and contributions so far. If you want any further information, our annual reports are on wcmc.wales. Or if you want to get in touch, have any ideas for us, can help us in any way with any of our projects or case studies, please contact me on the email address above. Um, and that's me, uh, Diochen Bauer. Thanks very much, Gwyn. Um, so there's a good few questions after building up for you, but we'll go over to Rosemary first and then we'll have the questions after Rosemary slot. So um, just to introduce Rosemary very briefly, uh, Rosemary Jenkinson is a chartered civil engineer working for Ovarban Partners. She's extensive experience delivering flood and coastal risk management appraisals across both Wales and England. She's led the delivery of outline business cases for Whitchurch and Cardiff Council 2020, Barmouth Gwynedd Council 2019 and Pernaheron Bay Conway Council 2018. Uh, Rose is also supporting the Environment Agency appraisals with the co collaborative delivery framework. Her broader experience includes considering resilience and capital-based approaches in investment decision making to achieve total value solutions. And Rosemary's going to speak to us about Barmouth North Promenade. Over to you, Rosemary. Hi everyone, uh, let me just share my screen. Is that up? Can you see? Yep, confirmed. Yep, great, perfect. So thank you for joining today. Um, so today I will be sharing our experiences of developing the Barmouth North Promenade outline business case, particularly around developing a managed adaptive approach to support the long term resilience of the area and sharing some of our experiences of considering managed realignment policies within urban contexts. So um, as has already been outlined, my name is Rose, Rose Jenkinson and I'm a chartered water engineer working for the Arab Bristol office. Um, I was supporting project manager for the delivery of the OBC. Um, and we collaboratively developed the OBC with Gwyneth Council and ABP Mayor in 2019. And I would like to thank Robin Campbell, our project director, and Owen Griffiths, the Gwyneth Council lead, for their key roles in the development of the OBC and, OBC and their contributions to this presentation. So Barmouth is located in um, Gwyneth on the west coast of Wales, north of the Affamadic Estuary. And the North Prom Promenade is the northmost section of the Barmouth developed frontage. So it's a 1.2 kilometre study area um, with a mixture of hard coastal defences, including a concrete rock revetment from the 1930s, um, a sheet pile wall from the 1950s and a wave recurve wall from the 1970s with further masonry setback walls along the high way and promenade and there's two neighbouring SMP2 policy areas um, so Barmouth South Promenade lies adjacent to the centre of Barmouth and comprises the main amenity beach and then northwards towards Hamper there's a managed shingle bank which provides coastal protection to the Cambrian Coast Railway um, and the present <coughs> The present defence arrangement supports a number of key functions um, of the town. So notably, the promenade is a valued asset, so it provides access to the blue flag kind of shingle sand beach. Um, the seafront front provides the local population with leisure and recreational amenity, including opportunities for walking and cycling and access to the beach. And the seafront and promenade also form an important part of the visitor appeal. So with tourism considered vital to the local economy. 
and the defences protect a number of assets, including the strategic Cumbrian Coast Railway. And notably, this line was badly damaged during the 2014 storms along different extents. Um, and required around 10 million of capital repairs and the closure of this line had significant ec economic impacts across the area with including Barmer. So our objective for Barmer North Promenade was to develop a holistic solution which aimed to mitigate coastal flood and erosion over a long term time frame, but also consider how we could improve the amenity and the environmental value of the coastline and also safeguard the local community and tourism focused economy of the local area. So why do we need an FCRM scheme? So Barmouth North Promenade experiences a number, um, a significant number of challenges. So firstly, the existing defences have experienced significant deterioration and now have an anticipated residual life of less than 10 to 20 years. And lowering of the beach at the northmost end of the promenade has exposed the sheet piles, which are now at risk of structural collapse and stability failure due to the washout of vines. A breach of the defences would result in significant coastal inundation and risk to life. And notably in March 2020, the northmost end of the promenade collapsed, resulting in emergency works being required by Gwyneth Council. And Barmouth and in particular its northmost promenade are at significant risk of flooding. It's commonplace to see overtopping at the northmost end of the promenade in relatively normal conditions and recent winter storms have highlighted that wave overtopping can be significant um, along the northern extents such as those experienced in January 2014 um, in the storms at that period where a number of residents had to be evacuated um, and you can see some of those pictures on the screen. Um, and the current issues will be further exacerbated by the effects of climate change and sea level rise. Um, so Welsh Government guidance indicates in this location it's anticipated to be over 1.1 metres over a 100 year period. And this then puts a community and local economy um, at increasing risks. And due to the scale of flood and coastal erosion risks, affordability and buildability of possible solutions was a key challenge in delivering a viable solution. So in terms of the SMP2 policy context, um, the current policy in EPOP 1 for the urban frontage of Barmouth North Promenade is to continue to hold the line um, and the SMP2 indicates that with ex significant pressures already on the shoreline defences the north of Barmouth, um, with the additional implications of climate change and sea level rise, um, the present alignment will become likely to be increasingly difficult to sustain. So therefore, for the medium and long term, EPOX 2 and 3 respectively, the SMP2 recommends a change in approach to manage realignment. Um, the SMP2 wording reflects the high level nature of the assessment and then suggests greater local flexibility than the table indicates. But it's also important to note to the south and the north, the SMP2 policy for the areas is hold the line across the defined epochs. And or as all three policy areas are intrinsically linked, so they have interacting coastal processes and they collectively form part of the wider flood cell, it's recommended they are progressed and considered as one overall area. So managed realignment can take a variety of forms and primarily has been implemented to date in rural locations across the UK. Um, and within the context of Barmouth North Promenade, a defender frontage due to the presence of um, the adjacent hold the line policy areas and a number of key assets, including the strategic transport link, the Cambrian Coast Railway. We consider this to entail creating a sustainable beach width by setting back the defences to a more sustainable location. However, implementing such an approach within an urban defended environment presented a number of challenges which I'm just going to briefly outline. So the SMP2 is a high level engineering technical analysis. So with limited guidance over its implementation locally, it was hard to visualise what this would look like and the triggers for change across our study extents. And significantly, the SMP2 acknowledges that managed realignment towards the north could incur the loss of a number of properties at North Promenade and this would have significant social, cultural and economic impacts on the communities which needed to be considered as part of the decision making process. 
There was also a further question of local community understanding. So for whilst the SNP2 has involved significant engagement, it appeared there was a disconnect amongst the community of what was proposed within the area and the associated justification for such measures. And this highlighted how the SNP2 policies are potentially received or perceived as more remote for affected communities. And affordability was also a consistent challenge for Gwyneth. So particularly recognising that managed realignment projects are generally more complex and time consuming than classic defence schemes. In, for instance, a populated area, walking away from the hard defences in this location could present um, unacceptable hazards, so health and safety issues to the local community. Therefore, decommissioning and relocation of the existing defences is required, which carries significant risks um, and costs that need to be managed carefully over the long term. And whilst impacts on the communities which may need relocating in the longer term presents funding challenges and also places pressures on existing housing stocks or suitable land being available and recognising these pressures it was important to remain open-minded about possible solutions or options available and furthermore the benefits of the expenditure were hard to articulate particularly with the limited environmental gain possible. So a key challenge to developing a preferred approach was aligning complete competing objectives so how could we deliver a solution which balances affordability at both local and national levels, um, better protects the community whilst unlocking wider benefits and avoiding kind of negative visual and amenity impacts on a kind of largely tourism focused economy, but also aligns with SMP2 policies and Welsh Government business case guidance, particularly ensuring that a hold the line policy remains in place in adjacent policy areas. So to overcome this and recognising the significant uncertainties around the scale and timing of potential climate change and juicy level rise, we considered applying an adapted pathway approach um, to support the long term resilience of the area. So this involves investment now in actions to manage today's risk while monitoring changes over time to mitigate future risks. Um, and would involve sequences of potential actions that could be implemented as conditions evolve in response to climate change risk and opportunities. Um, so this provides an approach to support the incorporation of uncertainty into investment decision making, promoting the resilience qualities of reflection, flexibility and integration into the preferred approach. So to look at this for a series of different options, we considered different pathways across um, the appraisal period to achieve a specific standard of protection and understand the associated benefits. And we recommended that this process was developed further at the next stage to define detailed pathways, which include monitoring and evaluation processes, key milestones or trigger points and associated downstream pathways to safeguard the existing community from increasing risks. So ultimately, recognising there is inherent value in the existing defences, the preferred approach looked to make the best use of the existing defences for as long as it's safe and economical to do so. Um, and as the primary wall withstands significant storm events at present, um, to avoid kind of disturbance and destabilisation to that structure, we've proposed setback wall structures um, along the promenade and highway and further measures, including um, additional tow protection and refurbishment of sections that are performing poorly. Um, and then beyond kind of 2069, it's anticipated managing coastal risks will become increasingly challenging. So therefore, it's anticipated there will be a need to transition to a form of managed realignment. Further work is required, but we anticipate this could be to the northmost extents um, with beach managements to the south to minimise impacts on the local community. So ultimately, this pathway approach looks to allow the community to continue to gain tourism and social and wellbeing benefits from the promenade for a significant duration of the scheme 
um, looks to safeguard residential properties within Barmouth itself and provides for flexibility for the uncertainty of climate change and also an extended time frame for considering funding mechanisms um, and supporting managed realignment within the area. And it's hoped that this approach provides um, an effective approach to investment, setting in motion meaningful conversation with the community. So looking forwards, um, looking towards the future of the application of the S&P2 policies and speaking with Jean-Francois of the Wales Coastal Group Forum, there are a couple of key points that he highlighted for further consideration when we are looking to implement S&P2 across Wales and ensure a resilient future. So some of these key points including that SMP2s need to be fully understood and embedded as part of decision making at both national and local strategic planning if we are to ensure a resilient Wales. We must also ensure that new evidence is gathered where changes are likely and the Wales Coastal Group Forum have um, developed the major change policy process to ensure that evidence underpins these change, proposed changes. And there's also to be an SMP2 refresh in Wales in the next couple of months um, with an update and any challenges to action plans. And then there is an intention for this to provide direction to the Wales Coastal Groups Forum to support the prioritisation of policy units where further work is required. And then there's also a need to understand um, triggers for change, especially where hold the line um, policies are due to change in EPOC 2. Um, with Wales Coastal Group Forum keen to support this. So thank you for your time and that's everything from me for now. Thanks very much Rosemary. Um, so I think we have about 10 minutes for questions before we get a lunch break. Um, starting with Gwyn, there's a good few. If uh, Gwyn has his camera back on, he's back in the game. <laughs> Hi Gwyn. Um, so there was a few questions about baseline surveys. Is there consideration given to having a one-off um, survey as a baseline and um, looking at bigger um, scale, I suppose, LIDAR surveys, or um, you did say that there was funding issues. Could you tell us more about the, the baseline and how you dealt with it proportionally? Yeah, of course. Um, so we actually use the word baseline for a fairly high, high density survey. Um, which there was no chance we had the money to do that across Wales, because once you've got a high density survey, you can go back and do a, what we call a profile survey, which is a lower density survey at regular intervals. You, you've built a bit of an understanding of the beach. You don't need to do such high density surveys. Um, yeah, we absolutely did look at, at Pan Wales, if nothing else is a cost exercise. So we figured out with our budget, we could have done, I think it was one profile every kilometer across the whole Welsh, coastline um, but there would have been a lot of areas that wouldn't have benefited from that there's some stable geologically stable places where nobody lives um, and then there's areas where the, the gap between the profiles is extremely important we would have missed a lot of data so um, ultimately we, we were aware that the Welsh government had already commissioned a pan Wales lidar survey which includes the coastline uh, it's, it's not the, a higher density very high density survey obviously they're doing the whole of Wales but we felt it was sufficient enough that that would cover our baseline survey so that that's going to going to fill that in for us. Okay thank you very much um there's a question I think that applies to you both um, about what stage is it considered appropriate to start consultation with homeowners and stakeholders of potential relocation and uh, links to other questions about the risk-based methodology is um, where properties are affected going to bump up the risk for your surveys Gwyn? Um, yes yeah, so I, I don't know if you remember the slide of the mumbles that was really for illustrative purposes but what we actually did was we used um, we used GIS mapping and we plotted all the properties um, and infrastructure from the National Receptor Database and plotted all the policy units. And from there, we dropped on the tidal flood risk model um, and we counted all the properties that fell within that survey unit. And that's how we scored asset risk. Uh, and again, for erosion risk, it was a 50 meter buffer. So if any property fell within 50 meters of the high water line within a survey unit, that got a score. And, and of course, we factored in the National Coastal Erosion Risk Model erosion rates into that score as well. 
thanks very much. And Rosemary, do you have um, a comment on the consultation for properties affected? Yes, so um, we, as part of Barmouth, we did undertake some initial stakeholder engagement um, in and in doing so kind of supporting a raising of awareness of um, the SMP2 policies within the actual area. But I think it's important that communities are involved kind of early on within the decision making process so that they can be engaged with and understand the justification for kind of moving towards the policies which are being proposed in that area. Um, in terms of engagement with regards to the potential relocation, I think um, I'd have to refer to Gwyneth for their kind of experience with Fairbourne um, for that. But I know it's kind of important that's been undertaken as early as possible um, for them to understand kind of the justification for such measures. Thank you. And can you advise who the lead risk management authority was for Barmouth? It's Gwyneth Council. So Owen Griffiths is the lead. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just trying to see now which questions are not related to anything I've asked already because there's a few that overlapped. Um, there's a bit of a, a wild card one that we've missed James and Andy for, but you might have an opinion on it. Uh, maybe more of a question for policymakers, but you mentioned that an intervention for one risk management authority in one location could have negative impacts on coastal processes in a neighbouring risk management authority. Are you confident the current policies allow for enough scrutiny to address risk? And this kind of links with another one about the, the surveys, Gwyn, that how do you make sure interdependencies are accounted for in a, in a survey like this? Oh, I feel like that's the point of why, why we exist really is that we're trying to take this national approach to make sure we build up an understanding of the wider coastal processes and we can feed that back to the risk management authorities. Um, I'm not I'm not a policy maker by any means, so uh, it doesn't fall under my responsibility, but I, I think provided that the risk management authorities have got the right people in place who are, who are in the coastal management, uh, coastal groups, then that should pick up uh, the shared shared assets and, and processes along the coastline. So that to me is a mechanism that should work provided people are, are invested in that. OK, thank you. Um, there's a question here about Barmouth specifically for Rosemary. Um, with the challenge of aligning project solutions to the shoreline management plans, um, do you feel that the SMP supported or conflicted with other project objectives? Um, were, you, were your hands tied as a team with the approaches you might adopt? And how do the community respond to your decisions for the proposed option? Yeah, I think um, I think the SMP2 is a kind of overarching um, kind of engineering technical analysis. So we were looking to then apply that in quite a local specific context, understanding the kind of key constraints in the area. And ultimately, I think it provided the kind of right direction in terms of the policy because of the scale of flooding, which was um, identified. But I think there was some limited guidance in terms of how it should actually be implemented and what it could look like within that location. Um, so I think, yeah, it was supportive, but also did kind of create challenges in itself in trying to kind of deliver an OBC, which aligned to lots of different competing objectives, particularly around the SMP2 policy as well. OK, thank you. Um... I'm scrolling away now to see if there's any unanswered ones. Um, there's COVID, of course, to be so foresee, and you, you actually touched on it going uh, about uh, COVID uh, making survey costs go up or delay. Um, but there's also a question about who undertakes the surveys. Um, can you advise if uh, they're all in-house or if you get support from others? Uh, yeah, so we've got a small survey team. Obviously, I've got quite a lot of survey experience myself. Uh, and a coastal scientist and now an undergraduate so we do a small amount of surveys in-house our team are actually mostly quality controlling the data that's collected by um, external contractors so we, we, we procure about sell to whales for our surveys and Gwyneth and Conway have both got survey teams that they've volunteered to collect coastal data so in the last year or so we've been helping train them up to improve their uh, coastal approach to survey techniques uh, and we're also open to other risk management authorities if they're interested in in collecting coastal surveys and they've already got survey teams 
um, we're, we're keen to, to work with them and train them up for coastal surveys. Uh, as for COVID, um, we're, we're already starting to see the next set of costs for surveys and I, I haven't done a direct comparison, but my immediate impression is yes, they have increased. Uh, as we're going out to external contractors, they, they've got more risk. So they potentially, depending where they're going to be working, they might have to send multiple vehicles for, for safety. They might have to have extra rooms for accommodation. Um, and then there's, there's also the risk of the local authority refusing them access to survey the beaches and we miss the tidal opportunity. So all around there's increased risk, which obviously translates to increased cost. OK, thank you. And I think the last question before we take a break is, uh, is there a risk of duplication of effort with NRW and uh, yourselves producing coastal overtopping forecasts? And how is that going to be managed to avoid confusion with the public? Um, so the the overtopping forecasting that's being done by CMAR, we recently had a workshop, both NRW and coastal officers from each of the local authorities sat in on the workshop, so everybody's aware all the work that's being done. I'm not sure that NRW's um, forecasting is available to the public that you can sign up to it, whereas this this can. And they're, they're both different approaches at the back. The models are, are built differently. Um, and this, this model is specifically built for localised uh, areas, whereas NRW, I mean, they've been doing it for so long. They've got so much time put into the accuracy of it as well. Um, so they, they're very solid for their locations. Great. Thanks very much both for your presentations and uh, I'm sorry we can't give you the, the virtual clap, but you can imagine. <laughs> um, uh, we have a quick break now and we're due back at five past one. Uh, if you could be on time, uh, those of you having a, a quick cup of tea and coming back, um, that would be great. And I'll be handing over to Melissa Mahaver snow who's going to chair our afternoon session. Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks all. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Well done. Thanks.
Hello and welcome to this 18th Welsh National Flood Conference due to start shortly. Welcome to the second session of the 18th Wales National Flood Conference, due to start shortly. I can ask our IT extraordinaire, George, to take down the holding slide so we can start the second session. Keith, you've placed yourself on mute. Hello and welcome back to this 18th Wales National Flooding Conference Management and Resilience, jointly with between ICE, the Institution of Civil Engineers and CIWEM, supported by the Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales. Just like to add my extra thanks to the sponsors for this event, without which we couldn't have proceeded. We'll move on to the second session now. And I'm delighted to ask Melissa, um, who's going to chair the second session. So Melissa Snow, uh, Mahava Snow is project executive within the projects and project delivery team within Natural Resources Wales. She's also heavily involved with the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management in various guises and sits on the Welsh branch. So I hand you over now to Melissa to take the chair se session. Welcome back everybody. Uh, well, what a treat we have in store in this session with two of the speakers being from Natural Resources Wales, no less. Um, we are having a little bit difficulty with one of the speakers. So um, what I'll do is I'll go straight over to um, David. So David Tarrant is a lead specialist advisor within the National Flood Risk Analysis Team at NRW for the last 12 years. I will now hand over to David to introduce his presentation. Many thanks, uh, Melissa. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So yeah, as Melissa states, I'm one of the lead specialist advisors uh, within uh, the National Flood Risk Analysis Team. So my colleague Simon James uh, presented um, the For All project to everyone last year. And so this is kind of a, a follow up presentation really to um, expand on the the new mapping products that we published some already and some we're going to publish in the future. So if you just bear with me one second while I share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that OK. So this is um, just an overview of um, what we're looking at today. 
So we're going to do a one slide overview of the kind of FRAW uh, project itself. We're then going to touch on the, the three new mapping products. So the national hazard and risk maps, um, the new FRAW map and the new flood map for planning, which fall under the uh, umbrella, heading, umbrella heading of Wales flood maps. We'll also touch on some kind of website updates as well and kind of some improvements we're making to um, the kind of user journey through our website. So just to recap for those who weren't at the conference last year, um, FRAW, so Flood Risk Assessment Wales, is essentially um, a replacement to the old NAFRA product. Um, so when we were part of EA Wales, we used to benefit from the, the EA NAFRA product. But since we split away and formed NRW, we formed our new product. So this is essentially a, a national flood hazard and kind of risk mapping study, which covered um, all sources of flooding in Wales. So rivers, the sea, surface water and small water courses. And we looked at a whole kind of range of events uh, and scenarios, including both kind of present day risk and also uh, climate change risk within kind of 100 years time. And all this data kind of uh, fed into a updated community at risk register. So for those who are aware of it, this is a tool that we use within NRW and Welsh Government to help prioritise um, flood risk activities and funding. Internally within uh, NRW as well, we have this uh, new economic tool set that we've created, which helps generate kind of cost benefit analysis uh, for kind of initial assessment schemes and also looking at kind of long term investment strategy. You know, thanks to this project, um, we are a data rich uh, organisation now and through the kind of open data government licence, uh, we're looking to share that um, more openly and more freely coming the weeks and months. And finally, really, it's just an acknowledgement that the, the four projects um, delivered the building blocks. So these building blocks are now feeding into these new uh, mapping products in different kind of shapes and different forms. So the first new product uh, that I'd like to talk about is the new national flood hazard and risk maps. Um, so these are, were created uh, as part of the kind of flood risk regulations uh, requirements. It, these maps don't have any official status for planning or insurance purposes. Um, they're purely just to meet uh, the flood risk regulations. They are an undefended product and they're based on the kind of national model only. So it doesn't take into account any kind of local or more detailed information. It's a, just a consistent national product. It's based on kind of present day risk. And this information was published um, earlier in the year, both on our website and within uh, the clay portal as well. So uh, you can go out and freely download this now. So hopefully if the technology works, um, I'm just looking at our website now. So if you Google uh, NRW flood maps or go onto our kind of home page and look in the flooding section, you'll end up on a kind of a flood risk landing page which shows these maps. Uh, so what we have here is the, the hazard and risk maps and we have kind of three categories. So we have our kind of national flood risk areas, our national flood risk maps and our kind of national hazard maps. So what we're looking at here is kind of some uh, flood depth information. Uh, colour coded to the different uh, depths across across the area. Uh, this is all available across the whole of Wales. So NRW has decided to publish this for the whole of Wales, not just the uh, flood risk areas itself. So we've got some cool information as well if you're interested in kind of depth or velocity. So here we're showing the kind of magnitude and the direction of velocity. And you can kind of zoom in and out and these arrows kind of auto scale uh, to the zoom range you're interested in. So we have depth, velocity, kind of hazard and extent, and we have those for the, the three flood sources, so rivers, sea and surface water and small water courses. And then if I switch over to the risk maps, so as part of the um, flood risk regulations, we need to publish maps that show risks to people, uh, economics and the environment. So in Wales, we've decided to kind of aggregate these risks to a community scale and then publish these. So this example I'm showing on the screen here is uh, risks to people. So generally where there's red polygons, there's higher risks and then the green polygons uh, show lower risks. 
So there's a whole wealth of information there and a lot of this is attributed as well. So you can go in using the tool functions and kind of uh, pick out that information. So I jump back to the slides. So yep, there are the national hazard and risk maps. Uh, the next set of maps is the kind of flood risk assessment Wales map. So we're calling this the FRAW map. So this sits under the new kind of umbrella uh, heading in the, the new strategy that was mentioned this morning of Wales flood maps. So this map is really targeted to check if you are at flood risk. So if you're a member of the public or you're a professional and you're looking to buy a house, or you're looking to insure your house, or you're trying to understand just the level of flood risk in your area, this is the map um, that we were targeting people to use. So it's, it's a defended product. So the map takes into account the presence of all the flood defences, so all the Welsh Government investment. And the map is kind of built upon the, the national model and local models. So it's built upon the best available information uh, that NRW holds. And to stress, this is a present day map. So um, it's just map, the map based on present day risk as of today. So this will be launched uh, with a strategy uh, next week on the on the 20th of October and will be available uh, directly on our website and also on the, the clay portal for download. So I can give you a little, um, hopefully a little test view uh, within, within our internal environment. So this is what the map will look like. Uh, so on the left hand side, we've got our layer list and again, we've got an interactive map on the right. So we've got the three main layers here. So this is flood risk from rivers, flood risk from the sea and flood risk from surface water and small water courses. Uh, these have been color coded with the kind of blues, greens and purples. And we try to be consistent with other nations. Um, so if you're looking at SEPA or other websites like the EA, there should hopefully be some consistency in the colour scheme. When we talk about rivers, what we're talking about is catchments bigger than three kilometres squared. And then when we reference down here, small water courses, we're talking about catchments, catchments smaller than three kilometres squared. Uh, we have a whole host of information down the left hand side here as well. So we've got um, flood defences. So you can see the red lines on the map show the flood defences and we have this new layer or kind of a revised layer called areas benefiting from defences. So we've broken these up into kind of areas uh, benefiting from defences for river, uh, risk of rivers, uh, risk from the sea and risk from kind of joint rivers and the, and the sea. So this is a little bit different to those who are used to kind of referring to ABDs on our published flood map. These new areas um, show any standard of protection. So if your defence say has a one in 10 year protection, we're showing um, the area benefiting from that defence cut to the extent of the flood outline. So what we're saying is this area benefits um, in some cases to a very small degree from that defence, but there is some benefit nonetheless. And then again, we have these layers down the list here. So things like shoreline management plans, coastal erosion, uh, flood storage areas and kind of recorded flood extents. And also we're publishing for the first time as well this kind of risk level under review. So where NRW is making improvements to its mapping uh, and modelling, um, we're making users aware that those improvements are going on and to kind of speak to your local team to find out more information about them. OK, so that's that's the floor map. Uh, finally, the, the third mapping product is uh, the draft flood map for, for planning. So again, this sits under the kind of umbrella heading of Wales flood maps. So a lot of you will be aware there was a draft consultation by Welsh Government uh, earlier in the year uh, about the new TAN 15. Um, there was kind of some response back from that about there weren't any maps uh, available with that consultation. So Welsh Government have requested us to uh, mock up some draft products, uh, which Johnny Thomas is going to be sharing in um, a series of kind of workshop sessions over the coming weeks and months, uh, which I believe uh, various parties will be invited to to comment on. So we've been asked to produce kind of two views, uh, a basic view and a detailed view. So a basic view it just kind of shows uh, whether you're in a flood risk area or you're not. And then a detailed view gives you a lot more information uh, about the level of risk and the type of risk. So a bit a bit like the development advice map, which we now publish, this is a undefended product. 
it's based on uh, national and local models. So it's the best representation of risk we have available. And it's based on a climate change scenario. So a lot of you would have noticed in the town 15 consultation that both uh, the flood zones, flood zone two and flood zone three will include uh, a climate change central estimate. So as I mentioned, we're mocking up some drafts, which I can show you now for consultation. But the plan working with Welsh Government, um, Johnny, Johnny Thomas, who we're working with, has alluded to that this will be available hopefully in spring uh, next year. So just to give a little sneak peek of what the consultation map might look like. So we use this uh, ArcGIS online technology and there's a big disclaimer that comes in straight away when you log in. So to really stress to everyone, this is a draft product which we're sharing for consultation. So it can't be used um, to support any kind of planning applications uh, as we speak. But essentially, um, the, the main layers are on the left here. So you have the risk from rivers um, and you have the risk from the sea. Hopefully these will draw. And then what we'll be sharing as well is what we're calling TAN 15 defended areas up here. So for the purposes of the consultation, these are going to be um, just red polygons due to kind of technical limitations of this product. But on the published map, it'll be uh, a better uh, a better color or better hatching used. So I won't dwell on that too much now, um, but just awareness that there will be invites to consultations in, in the near future. So I'm conscious of time, so just the last two slides. Uh, we're making some improvements to our website as well. So when you come into our website, we're very keen and conscious that people use the right map for the intended purpose. So like I said, if you're looking to buy a house um, or understand your level of flood risk, you know, to target the floor map. But if you're coming into looking to develop an area or apply for planning permission and you want to um, use the new flood map for planning to make sure you end up on the right product. So we're improving the pages and kind of simplifying the products. And we've also put a survey on this page as well. So we really welcome feedback um, as we develop these pages and maps over the coming months uh, to how we can improve that. And then just the last slide, really. Um, we're conscious we've had a lot of feedback in the past um, that the user experience in our website isn't always great. It can be sometimes confusing uh, about what we need to click on and how to use the mapping products. So we're going to make improvements to the look and feel of our map viewers, improve the technology behind it. Obviously, with the new accessibility requirements as well, we need to make the maps more accessible. But the biggest change will be um, introducing kind of a postcode search to, similar to the EA product, whereby you can log in, you can type your postcode and it will bring you back a textual report of risk. So we find a lot of people don't want to use the maps or understand the maps. So instead, you can just have a nice report uh, that explains uh, your level of risk. So those improvements have started already and uh, a kind of ongoing project and we hope to launch that kind of spring summertime uh, next year. Great okay so thanks uh, for listening everyone uh, so check out our website for some maps that are there already new fraud map goes live next week and um, if you've got any questions uh, regarding the maps there's obviously a Q&A session uh, today but that's our team uh, email address so you're more than welcome to email us and we'll pick those up. So thanks very much and I'll hand back to Melissa. Uh, Melissa, you're on mute. Thanks, George. Uh, so thank you very much, David. Um, there will be a Q&A session after all the speakers have finished their presentations. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Claire Pillman. Claire joined Natural Resources Wales as its Chief Executive in February 2018. Claire is extremely passionate about the environment of Wales and its importance for future generations. She really is a champion for the environment. Claire is also a people person and she often tells us how grateful she is of everyone's hard work over the difficult times in particularly the last year. I will now hand over to Claire to introduce her presentation. Um, Dear Melissa um, and thank you in particular to David 
for jumping into the breach there um, when my uh, IT connection um, uh, went wrong. Um, uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to start with, with a thank you to ICE for, for organising today's event and to reflect just on, on the power of, of the speakers we've already had this morning, um, who really brought to life the challenges that uh, we are all facing in Wales. I was, I was really interested to hear the Minister talk about the forthcoming publication of Welsh Government's new national strategy for co flood and coastal erosion risk management and we look forward to seeing that published next week and to working closely with Welsh Government and partners to implement and take forward the policy framework in order to make Wales more resilient to flooding in the future. Today, I would like to share my perspectives on the events of February this year and on how our experiences of the exceptional weather events that unfolded at that time should inform our collective flood risk management ambitions in the future. When I think back to February, these are the scenes at the forefront of my mind. Emergency services rescuing people from their homes, roads transformed into rivers, and lives upended up and down the country by the worst flooding seen across Wales in a generation. For these people, the worst had happened. But I'm also reminded of the commitment, hard work and the community spirit that came to the fore at that time and helped to start to get those communities back on their feet. It's the people who endured the impacts of February storms that I have in mind as I address you all here today, as we turn our attention to the longer term decisions we all need to make to help Wales make Wales more resilient to extreme weather in the future. The Met Office's confirmation that February 2020 was the wettest February on record will not have come as any great surprise to those of us who lived through it. The successive bands of heavy rain triggered by storms Chiara, Dennis and Horde came on top of the fifth wettest winter the UK has seen since records began in 1862. The rainfall experienced over the winter period was exceptional. February's rainfall alone impacted on already sodden land that simply couldn't absorb any more water. Having widespread extreme rainfall events in the same calendar month is extremely rare. 288 millimetres of rain fell on average across Wales in that month, with some areas experiencing three and a half to four times the long term monthly average. When the Met Office produce rainfall data, their maps typically record up to 200% of average rainfall. You'll see in this map here that in February 2020, the scale went above 400% for some areas, including Valor in North Wales, which experienced four times the long term average monthly rainfall. This slide shows a map of the rainfall during Storms Dennis and Chiara. You can see the impacts were right across Wales and across the west of Britain generally. North Wales bore the blunt brunt of Storm Chiara and the catchments of the rivers Conwy, Elwy and Upper Dee received the highest amounts of rainfall and experienced some of the highest river levels. Storm Dennis focused its intensity on South Wales, with extreme rainfall falling over a very short and intense period over the top of the South Wales valleys and the Brecon Beacons. The Vernwy rain gauge in Powys recorded an extraordinary 515 millimetres rainfall in February, making it the wettest February for that area since records began in 1908. So where exactly did the rain fall? These maps illustrate the distribution of rainfall during Chiara and Dennis, highlighting the significant rainfall totals within a 48 hour period across Wales. The purple and white areas are the areas of greatest rainfall. Storm Chiara led to heavy rainfall over Snowdonia and particularly the headwaters of the River Conwy. 
Storm Dennis produced extreme rainfall across the top of the South Wales valleys and Brecon beacons, with a particular focus on the rivers Fronda and Taff catchments and high up within the River Usk catchment. If we look at the Storm Dennis map in focus, the exceptional nature of this event and the localised impact of the rainfall can be seen. The white patches you see are the areas that experience the heaviest rain. Just take a moment to appreciate how localised they are on the Upper Usk and between Hafonda and Cunnan Valleys and also over to Ebervale. You can see how these localised peaks contributed to the impacts we saw in places like Pontypridd and elsewhere, with over 130 millimetres of rain falling in 24 hours in some places. That is a significant amount of rain by any accounts. Flooding from storms Kiara and Dennis was certainly exacerbated by the saturated floodplains from the previous bouts of heavy rain experienced over the winter. This left rivers running high across Wales and meant that the severity of February's rainfall would see river levels react extremely quickly, reaching record levels and flows. There's a lot on this slide, so, so let me just go through it. it. It does show you just how significant the events of February were. This map plots out the 231 strong network of gauging stations and RW uses across Wales. The red dots show the stations that had the highest recorded level ever during last winter. An extraordinary 27% of all gauging stations. Almost a quarter, 22%, recorded their highest water levels ever during Storm Dennis. The blue dots takes this further, incorporating the gauging stations that have had their highest level in the last 10 years, not including this last winter. So combined, the red dots and the blue dots account for over half of all our gauging stations in Wales. The evidence underlines that these were exceptional events. They led to the flooding of 3,130 properties across Wales. It also highlights the fact that records are being broken with greater frequency, an indicator of a changing climate. These are some, just some, not all, of the rivers and locations where record river levels were set in February. Many of these go back years, up to 84 years ago in one case, and this information alone shows the significance of what happened. Storm Dennis was responsible for all but the last one at Pontegrithal on the River Elwy, which was during Storm Chiara. Just by way of, of note, the Elwy is the river that flows through St Asaph in Denbyshire. The river levels and flows during Chiara were greater than those during the flood events of 2012, when 320 properties and 70 caravans were flooded and a fatality occurred. This time though, thanks to the improvements that we made with funding from the Welsh Government, uh, there was only localised flooding and nowhere near the same impact that we saw in 2012. Storm Dennis's impact on the South Wales Valleys was exceptional. This storm hydrograph at Pontypridd tells the story of just how quickly the River Taff responded and just how much the levels exceeded the previous level set over 40 years ago when there was widespread flooding. At Pontypridd, the River Taff reached its highest level since records began in 1968. At its peak flow during the height of Storm Dennis, it is estimated that 805 cubic metres per second water was passing through Pontypridd enough to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool in just over three seconds. Over a 22 hour period, the river increased in height by 4.2 metres, going from about a metre to over five metres and recording a level 78 centimetres higher than the previous highest level, which was set during the 1979 floods. The flow nearly doubled from 405 cubic metres per second to 805 cubic metres per second in the six hours to the peak. The speed at which this unfolded was frightening and the resulting challenges for the emergency responders were clearly, as we know, really significant. But although many properties flooded in February, it was not to the level 
seen in 1979 in Cardiff and the Valleys due to the investments and decisions that were made in both in defences and other elements of flood risk management over recent decades. Behind all of this data, the facts and the statistics, of course, there is the stark reality of what people had to face as the storms raged through their communities. This image captures in dramatic style the impact of Storm Dennis, which was responsible for flooding 2,765 properties. The majority of the 3,130 properties impacted during February. This image was taken in Forest, where waters from the River Taff tore through the streets and ravaged homes and businesses. This is a main river, of course, but many places flooded from non-main river and other more local sources. The images captured on social media at that time tell their own tales of the powerful forces of nature at work through that night and into the morning in Forest. This metal container was no match for the swollen River Taff, its journey only coming to an end when it hit a bridge in the town. These were the scenes that unfolded in the middle of the night. It is sobering to think what the impacts might have been if this had happened during the day at a time when the school run was taking place or as people were trying to return home from work. While nature can change everything at a moment's notice, the impacts can be devastating and long lasting. These images show the bleak aftermath of the events as the waters start to subside and people start to return to their homes to begin the cleanup operation. Many are still recovering and rebuilding with the impact exacerbated by the additional pressures exerted on our communities by the global coronavirus pandemic. I witnessed for myself the scale of the structural and human impacts of floodwaters during my visits to some of the worst hit areas. The really resilience we saw in our communities at that time was very remarkable and their determination to overcome the challenges of the past few months has been genuinely inspiring. These exceptional events were a test for everyone involved in the emergency response, including ourselves. The size and scale of these storms meant that NRW was essentially in emergency response mode for more than five weeks on top of an already extremely busy winter period, working with partners to prepare communities and responding to conditions and challenges that impacted every part of Wales over a sustained period of time. I want to recognise here the dedication and sheer hard work of our staff who go the extra mile for people and communities. They were out clearing screens, putting up demountable defences such as here in Llanroos to help prevent impacts from the flooding of the River Conwy and in Abergwilly. And we had staff on demanding incident rotors, manning incident rooms 24-7, issuing warnings and managing our operational response. These actions that took place up and down the country certainly helped to ensure that many properties did not flood and that people were able to take action. Since February, NRW has been putting the most at risk communities front and centre of its recovery and repair efforts. These images show shoal removal work in Mountain Ash, removal of fallen trees from the River Team in Mid Wales. We have also introduced improved digital services on our website to provide com comprehensive flood risk, river level, rainfall and sea level information to households, businesses and communities in Wales. After every serious flood incident, NRW carries out a comprehensive internal review of its own procedures and its actions to ensure that we learn from the experience and make improvements wherever possible. We will publish the outcomes of our review work next week on the 22nd of October. So you will understand why I can't go into the detail of the findings until that time. Our own reviews will sit alongside the other reviews being undertaken by local authorities the Section 19 reports. These reports will be looking into the causes of flooding and will help inform future actions on how we can work together to make our communities more resilient to flooding in the future. But it is clear that there are challenges ahead and we have to accept that flooding will continue to happen. While we are much better protected in Wales now than we were during the 1979 floods, 
we can't and never will be able to protect everyone, everywhere, all the time. Despite the investment in flood risk management to date, February's events signalled that we need to do more to adapt to challenges that are here now and will be exacerbated in the future to manage the risk from flooding in Wales as well as we possibly can. While we cannot attribute every storm to the effects of climate change, the scientific evidence suggests that we are likely to see more of these extreme weather events in future. The climate emergency is here and it is real. In relation to flooding, we know that the language has changed from flood defence to flood risk management, and it now needs to shift further to climate change adaptation and the need to live with the inevitability that some flooding, despite our best endeavours, will occur. We can reduce some of the risks through managing the likelihood of and impacts from flood events, but we cannot control the weather and prevent all impacts. We need to work with communities in messaging this difficult reality to understand what is possible and what isn't to manage such extreme weather events. So, we know that the challenge of managing huge quantities of water as well as the rapid nature of many of our rivers and the subsequent rapid flooding is substantial. So if we're going to properly manage the flood risk brought on by this changing climate, we will need to think big to get ahead of the game and pull at all the levers at our disposal. There is no one single solution to flooding. We need to work together with communities and partners as flood risk organisations to take a long term strategic picture and to take those communities with us as we work on the issues, issues and potential solutions. In this context, context, as I say, we very much look forward to working with Welsh Government in the context of the new Welsh, the new strategy for flood and coastal erosion, erosion risk management. But even with this, within this context, as the Minister said, there are still difficult choices to make. That is why all levels of government the organisations responsible for managing flood risk, businesses and the communities and householders at risk need to be part of the decision making on how we respond to these challenges. We know we have to accept that we simply can't build ourselves out of trouble. Defences definitely have their place, as it has been discussed earlier, and our network of NRW managed flood defences spread across 500 kilometres in Wales are estimated to protect over 73,000 properties from flooding. But the answer doesn't lie in just using more and more concrete to build higher defences. Even if this is technically possible, economically justifiable and aesthetically acceptable, and it isn't in many cases, we know this can just push the water downstream to the next community or mean that the consequences are much greater if and when the defences are overtopped or breached. We need to engage people at all level in the debate around taking an integrated approach to flood risk management in the future, one that blends such hard engineered defences with natural flood management implementation where appropriate and improved community resilience. Accurate flood forecasting and warnings and efficient emergency response are part of the mix as well. As I've said, we need to use all the levers and tools at our disposal. As flood specialists like yourselves will know, flooding is not just about management of water infrastructure. It's also about land management and where we put communities and people in the first place. We need to think big, think catchment scale, and increasingly think, where are we going to make space for all this water when these extreme events happen? Planning departments and local authorities will need to be braver when it comes to making decisions around where people, property, communities and businesses are located. Can we do more to prevent people and property being put at flood risk at the outset? There needs to be further consideration surrounding how communities receive and react to flood warnings so that they are best prepared to take the right actions when warnings are issued. We also need to consider whether communities understand the significance of the different levels of warning and how flooding can quickly escalate and what they can do themselves to help their households and their communities. But the fact remains that we must all accept the inevitability that communities in Wales will flood again and that the threat is likely to become more severe and more frequent.
That is why our focus needs to be on working together, not only to reduce the risks, but also to help reduce the damage and recovery time when it does happen. Building flood resilient homes, for example, is not just a good idea, it is increasingly necessary. So to conclude, the devastating floods we saw in February serve not only as warnings, but as a call to action. This time it was inland flooding, but this very familiar picture, which we have already mentioned in the course of, of today of Fairbourne, reminds us of the huge challenges around the coast as well. The reality is that we need to adapt to our changing climate and the impacts it's bringing. I've referred in this presentation to the floods Wales experienced in 1979 and how that was a pivotal moment for flood risk management in Wales. It strikes me that February 2020 is another of those pivotal moments and we use this moment and the lessons learnt during the events of earlier this year to drive forward the action needed to adapt to the challenges of the future. We know that there are significant aspects to consider which require further discussion with partners, stakeholders and the communities affected. We all need to take our part. When it comes to how we manage more water in the changing climate, we need to work together. And as the minister said, we need to have these difficult but crucial conversations now. NRW is committed to being a strong voice in these discussions and our reviews into the floods of February 2020, which we'll publish next week, will inform how we ourselves can make improvements to help make Wales more resilient. Thank you very much for your attention and I and my team look forward to working with all of you on this for really what, what could be more important. Thank you very much, Claire. Next up is Tom Ray. Tom is an environmental engineer working for Atkins with 14 years experience in the water sector. I will now hand over to Tom to introduce his presentation. Hi everyone. So yeah, I'm Tom Ray and uh, as Melissa has said, yeah, I've been working for Atkins for some time. So my presentation today I'm going to be talking about the benefits of integrating surface water management and infrastructure and share some of the projects that we've recently been working on in this area. Um, it feels quite a big um, transition from the gravity of Claire's presentation to this, but there is some definite linkage, so hopefully this uh, follows on quite nicely. So I'm going to quickly run through the context around what happens to water as it joins us in our, our built up world and how it's managed and what the consequences are. And I'll give a bit of an overview of what's been changing and the projects that we're delivering as a result, which will go on to outline the benefits. So rather swiftly, what we do with the water, the two diagrams here from the SUDS manual, just to give us a quick reminder of the differences between the undeveloped and developed catchments. You can see different sized arrows relating to catchment response to rainfall. It should be fairly familiar. And in our urban areas, we like to control and constrain water and treat it a bit like an unwanted guest, which it clearly can make a nuisance of itself and um, we make sure that it's removed away as quickly as possible and hidden below ground and that approach to surface water management tends to go hand in hand with these kind of uh, pictures that you'd see in the photos so lots of hard impermeable surfaces but that is uh, a contributing factor to the sort of thing we've seen um, in Claire's presentation and as we know we're quite familiar with that this is a flooding conference after all um, so more pictures of the same sort of thing there for you. But what is changing uh, or what has changed? So as you'll be familiar, it's um, fairly old news now. The Welsh Government has implemented the Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act and we've got the SABS 
established and the new legislation that goes with that that we need to comply with for developments in Wales. Other recent developments you'll have heard of uh, declarations of climate change emergency from many of our um, administrative and uh, government bodies um, that may have been a bit overshadowed by uh, COVID-19 throughout the later part of this year but that was being talked about quite a lot um, earlier in the year and that's over the last year and uh, also picking up on the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act which we have in Wales which is fairly unique and amongst other things that uh, places a requirement on us to make sustainable decisions with regard to problems like climate change and um, health inequality. So what's all that got to do with uh, the um, projects that we're working on? So let's come on to that. I've got this uh, example, the Cardiff Cycleways. So Cardiff is making some excellent headway in creating a network of high quality cycleways that are segregated from other traffic. That's that image there um, from Cardiff Council gives you the general idea. And these are quite ambitious projects that are really trying to shake up travel in the city. Um, personally, I'm quite invested in their success. I do a lot of cycling myself and it's great to be a part of it. Um, but as there's significant reconfiguration of the road layouts involved with this to, to achieve the, um, the end goal, there's resultant alterations to the, the drainage collection systems and the drainage characteristics of the area and that means that these projects require SAB approval. And um, so as well as managing to find space in the highway for those cycleways, Cardiff and us as we work with Cardiff are having to include sustainable drainage suds into that arrangement. So um, here on the right, just to give you a flavour, we've got the a typical kind of layout showing two lanes for vehicles with suds strips running um, to provide that segregation. And um, another similar arrangement in, in the bottom here. So we've got those rain gardens and sud strips that um, integrated into that layout to give you this. Um, it sort of provide that segregation and uh, provide the sort of the, the drainage arrangement. So before we just answer sort of what are we doing with the surface water here that is different to what it currently does. So we are ensuring that uh, throughout these the, the modifications here that the highway runoff is draining to the highest priority runoff destination wherever possible. So in some cases for some areas that's meaning redirecting runoff that currently goes into combined sewers, bringing that up the priority ladder and redirecting that to water courses. Of course we're also implementing the appropriate hydraulic control and providing betterment on those runoff rates. So modifying a highway in this way is uh, a little bit unusual and doesn't sort of tie in with the way that development on a, a discrete site is usually approached. Um, so to make sure we're applying the SUD standards appropriately, we've engaged um, and liaised with the Cardiff SAB. So to make sure we've got the right the right approach. Um, just give a bit of an example on sort of betterment that the suds can provide. So if you take a typical um, uh, catchment draining to a highway gully that may generate peak flows around two litres a second in a intense um, one year 15 minute storm, and that would those flows you'd see that generated within within minutes. That same rainfall draining to a, uh, a rain garden or into a sud system is going to take three or four hours to transit through that filter bed. So you've got the massive attenuation of the 
um, the runoff rate through that process. So your, your resultant discharge is going to be a fraction of what you'd have had from the gully. And of course, you've got a reduction in your volume of your runoff as well by water that is retained and used in those in those suds features. So we could say that that's just the hydraulic benefits of suds in general, which in this project is contributing to reducing the, the overall flood risk, providing that resilience and removing storm water from combined sewers. But since we're talking about integrated infrastructure, what are the other benefits that this approach brings? So for for one, that you've got um, the runoff discharging from rain gardens has the pollutants removed and the water quality of that discharge is improved. And another area is uh, the visual amenity of the highway areas. So by introducing these planting areas and um, a variety of um, plants and um, trees and that sort of thing, we've we increased the visual amenity. So I think we would all be familiar with the um, success that has um, been achieved in, in Grangetown previously by um, retrofitting suds to that environment, going from this to this kind of um, uh, yeah, this, like, you know, this kind of amenity, this uh, this this view, We've gone from grey and um, tarmac and solid to planted. So back to the cycleways. In this setting, the planting can do more than just look nice, and the the plant areas can provide acoustic dampening and also contribute to air quality improvements as the plants are able to. Uh, absorb some of those air pollution. Um, yeah, some of the air pollution. And as much as possible, we've also tried to make sure that the rain gardens are providing a physical buffer between traffic and cyclists. Like this, the example on the left there shows a, um, yeah, a, a wide suds strip there between your cycleway and bus stops and the bus lane. And all of these things coming together contribute to making active travel an attractive and appealing option. So if we come back to the, the climate change emergency declarations and the Wellbeing Act, you see that this project is able to offer a wide range of benefits. So as well as addressing stormwater runoff and providing that resilience um, to flooding, the this integrated approach has a bigger contribution to the community and ultimately that um, helps with the overall success of the project for those multiple multiple benefits. Now, another benefit of integrating suds and stormwater management and the public realm is that you, when you couple that with a quality bit of landscape design, you create inviting places where people want to linger and people yeah, that's if you're familiar with the term of place making, that's that's what you're you're able to achieve. Which is another contribution contributor to improved well-being and improving the visual amenity. And I've added a few images here of a recent Atkins project in Kingston upon Thames, which shows this principle quite clearly. And it also includes a, a cycle track and yeah, it's got places for people to hang out and walk and exercise. And the reason for including that is we've got some similar project concepts being developed in Wales at the moment. So um, you can watch this space for that until such a time as we're able to say more. And then final slide here, I have um, a school since we're talking about the well-being of future generations that seems appropriate it's pushing the boundaries of my topic a little bit it's not quite public realm but again it, this illustrates some of the benefits that are brought about by introducing suds and the legislation um, that is supporting that so here in this in this school environment without those standards that we now have to follow this landscape could easily have ended up as just 
tarmac covered sterile spaces um, in the interest of saving money or being low maintenance, low hassle. But instead, what the students will benefit from is they have enhanced spaces, enhanced courtyard, which they can spend their lunch break in. And at the same time, they will be able to see how rainfall is being managed in their school. It's not hidden away in a gully. They've got a, a rain garden feature which they will see the water as it enters that and how that's managed. So to just quickly summarise the benefits of integrated infrastructure and giving water its place in the public realm, we uh, are able to address historic issues and provide resilience and be able to adapt to climate change. We've got amenity and a range of environmental improvements and it complements and encourages active travel and lastly contributing to well-being in society. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much Tom. The last speaker of the day is Alec Dane. Alec is a chartered civil engineer and specialises in coastal and maritime engineering. Alec has over eight years experience in FCE RM schemes and works for JBA Consulting. I will now hand over to Alec to introduce his presentation. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Melissa said, my name is Alec Dane and I'm presenting today on the Aberavon Promenade Coastal Risk Management Scheme, which I have been working on for the last three years. Originally as design lead and project manager for the detailed design phase, and then latterly as design support through the construction phase of the scheme. So the scheme was completed in July 2020 by Knights Brown Construction as principal contractor, with Neath Port Talbot County Borough Council acting as client and JBA Consulting acting as principal designer. The contract was run as an NEC3 engineering construction contract with a target cost, with Neathport Tolbert acting as project manager and site supervisor. So I'd like to take this opportunity now just to thank Ken Stacey, Richard Coleman and James Davis of Neathport Tolbert County Borough Council for the opportunity to present this project today. I'm now going to try and present my screen, so hopefully that's going to come through. So for today's presentation, I was going to focus on some of the more interesting aspects of the design and construction phases of this scheme and try to draw some lessons learnt that are hopefully applicable to other projects. So I'm going to start by introducing the scheme through a quick look at the justification of the project uh, in the problem and then look into the solutions that we developed and how that was practically delivered on site. So for those of you who don't know where Aberavon is, it's situated on the South Wales coast and it's a 2.1 kilometre sandy beach near Port Talbot in South Wales. The existing coastal defences constitute a concrete step to revetment and wave return wall supporting a popular promenade area behind. Situated immediately behind the promenade are several businesses, public amenities and care homes. It's estimated that the, area, or the beach area generates five to 15 million pounds worth of annual income to the local economy from the tourism sector. And Neathport Talbot see this as a key growth area for the future with three to seven million pounds worth of local economic growth planned in the near future. So if you see it on a nice calm day, as we're seeing today uh, in, in this photo, uh, you see some clean swell lines and nice gently sloping foreshore. And it's a very picturesque place and a nice day to spend bus beside the seaside. But see it on a storm event and it's a very different picture. Um, with the beach and promenade area bearing the full brunt of southwesterly storms and swells. It's probably not the full 14,000 kilometres that Gwyn was mentioning earlier today, but it's still a very large fetch that affects this site nonetheless. This particular photo is not taken on a particularly large storm event, but you can see the wave energy is dissipated on the impermeable and reflective structure with all of that energy transmitted back to the beach uh, and the foreshore below. The fine sand sediment is easily mobilised and as a result of the storm events, we often get beach levels drawn down quite significantly at the toe of the defences. 
So erosion and scour has been an ongoing issue throughout the course of the history of this structure. We see beach levels throughout the 1.2 kilometre frontage varying with both space and time. And we typically see annual cycles of winter drawdown and summer recovery, um, but crucially no real long term trend in sediment loss in this area. So those winter drawdown periods can expose in excess of one and a half metres of, of the uh, sheep pile toe, which was not designed particularly as a retaining structure, uh, more as a, as a kind of emergency uh, cutoff. So while not predominantly a flood, a, uh, flood risk problem, this is an erosion risk problem that has some pretty severe consequences uh, to the community of Neathport Talbot. So looking at the problem in a little bit more detail, primary concern for this area was that beach lowering was causing uh, undermining of the sheet pile, which could lead to instability in that particular element. There was concerns over the potential for voiding underneath the step structure and also voiding in the promenade, putting pedestrians and the public at risk uh, of, of health and safety issues. And there was general deterioration in the concrete structure commensurate with the age and, um, and, and performance of that structure. So if we were to do nothing at this site, we could see a rotation or failure of the sheet pile. That would expose the fill underneath the structure to direct wave action, which could lead to loss of the material. And that ultimately could lead to collapse of the concrete structure. So this isn't a hypothetical scenario. This is something that has, uh, has, has been seen throughout the area over the last 20, 30 years or so. In 1984, there was some significant scour noted across the whole of the area and the sheet pile toe we were looking at earlier was installed to try and uh, mitigate the impacts of that. The image presented on scheme here is a result of a collapse that happened in 1991 as a result of a storm event, which required some considerable reinstatements uh, in order to make it safe and, and prolong the life of this in the future. And since then, there's been ad hoc placements of rock armour toe protection at pinch points along the area to try and prolong the life of the existing assets. But there was no real long term strategy about how to maximise the use of this asset and adapt to climate change. So Neathport Talbot submitted an outline business case in 2016 for a scheme that would be designed to reduce the risk of coastal erosion, support regeneration and tourism, maintain and where possible enhance the environments, and improve access for the public down to the beach. The outline business case concluded that the preferred option would be to place a rock armour revetment to provide toe protection to the structure, to undertake some void filling exercises to uh, eliminate the, the risk of any sort of spans in structure, and to undertake concrete repairs to try and halt any further deterioration in the structure. For today, I was going to take each in element individually and focus on some of the more interesting aspects of the scheme. So the image presented uh, on, sc on screen here shows the detailed design of the rock armour toe protection. It's formed of a double interlayer, interlocking layer of rock armour founded on a geotextile filter layer. And that filter layer is there to prevent fine material from washing through the structure. The width of the structure was designed to accommodate all possible scour envelopes and, and width of scour holes that could develop under a range of storm events. But one of the key design considerations through the detailed design was how this would be practically delivered on site. By reducing beach levels in front of the sheet pile to form the rock revetments, we could risk the stability of that structure, uh, risking both um, the operatives and, and the public behind. So we set upon a, a bit of an exercise to work out how we could manage this risk. Uh, first stage, we were looking to eliminate the risk and we were seeking to do that by uh, yeah, essentially avoiding any need to excavate in front of the sheet pile. But due to the local geometry in that area, we would have had situations where rock would have been placed on top of the existing steps, causing arguably a, a greater health and safety concern for the public going forward. So what we did was we analysed the existing beach monitoring data in the area to work out where the beach kind of profile envelope could be uh, on the sheet pile. So look at the worst case beach levels that were recorded through the data and compare that against seasonal trends to see what is the typical beach level that might be up against that sheet pile. 
So through applying factors of safety onto that, we were able to minimise the excavation depths against the sheet pile and have some confidence that uh, you know, th these retained um, sand levels had, had been in place previously. Wynn's interesting presentation earlier today it was really great news to me as a designer because uh, often schemes are lacking this kind of information that's absolutely critical to making these key informed design decisions and it would have been invaluable for the Ab Aberavon scheme. This shows us placing rock um, and midway through the construction of the rock revetments uh, taken through drone imagery. So we have the moxies just out of uh, on the right hand corner of the screen delivering rock to the work face and then we have excavators sorting and, and filtering the, the rock armour. An excavator seeking to uh, cut to the required profile and then placing the double interlocking rock on top of the geotextile filter layer. So we're working in real short panel lengths to try and um, really minimise that risk and try and get rock in as soon as we can to, uh, to manage that risk effectively. We'd probably describe this as a supply driven design uh, and Neathport Talbot have key aspirations regarding sustainability, supporting local business and generating local income. So what we did in the detailed design phase was seek all quarry data from all uh, appropriate quarries within the local vicinity so that whatever we were designing um, through our calculations would be met by the local quarry uh, available to us. So this allowed pros prospective tenderers to, to contact a range of different quarries, uh, enabling us to both use a local supply and offer a competitive pricing uh, so the client got value for money. The map showed here shows the quarry that the successful tenderer uh, chose and, and selected. So we can see it's a really local delivery. We're, this is 20 minutes away by car, uh, away from our site, uh, probably a little bit longer with the wagons that we were bringing in, but um, a really efficient uh, transit of that rock armour. So that dealt with the supply to Aberavon itself, but actually getting the rock on the beach was a further challenge we had to overcome. In Aberavon, there's only one real access down to the beach for plants, and that's shown through the green, green arrow on the right here. That is an RNLI slip uh, that is in constant use and could be called upon at any point in time for an emergency. But coupled with this, that area of the promenade is probably one of the highest uh, usages by the public. So by trying to bring in 30,000 tonnes worth of rock armour um, in, in numerous deliveries over an eight month programme, we would be increasing a public plant interface and risk the, the uh, public through that. So the decision was taken early on in the design process to try and form a temporary access through the northern area at our site compound, as you can see there. That is a much less heavily used uh, area of the beach uh, and it would allow us to kind of service rock from both ends of the job. That reduced the public plant interface and it increased the efficiency of deliveries because we were suddenly not having to work around the public. And it provided us a further opportunity to provide a bit more of a long term legacy to the area. So this is our temporary access ramp, as we can see here, um, and we formed a, a nice gently, slouch, gently uh, yeah, formed slope to allow us to get the moxies down to the beach and deliver the rock armour. But in doing so, uh, we could provide long term legacy and, and, and improve access uh, for future generations by uh, creating this into a more formal access at the end of the job. So early in the design process, we sought to incorporate the temporary works into more permanent works to provide a, a slipway that would uh, kind of uh, improve access to the north uh, from beach and um, for maintenance and emergency response. So this shows us um, placing the precast concrete units to form the permanent slipway. Uh, on top of the temporary slipway that we formed uh, previously. And through this method, we were able to essentially chase ourselves out of the work, uh, work out, deliver all the rock armour we needed and then form a really nice slipway at the end of the job. So this is a precast panel uh, slipway formed on a mass concrete base over the uh, temporary access ramp that was formed. So this uh, slide shows um, some of the void uh, voiding and repairs work that we did on the main concrete structure and the outline business case concluded that there was potential for voiding and that was one of the 
uh, primary fail failure mechanisms of the structure. So during the detailed design phase, we uh, undertook a, an extensive intrusive and non-intrusive ground condition, uh, sorry, in, uh, investigations to try and scope the level of void filling we would be requiring through the construction contract. So we undertook a ground penetrating radar survey um, and tried to identify any anomalies within the ground conditions that could signal a, um, a void underneath the structure. But due to the presence of heavy reinforcements in the revetment slabs and, and the depth of the concrete, the signal we got from the GPR survey was disturbed and noisy and conclusions were difficult to draw upon the extent of any voiding identified. So we sought to undertake an intrusive coring campaign across the length of the structure, essentially forming a grid over the structure and coring through using an endoscope then to try and quantify the, um, the, the voids underneath the structure. This showed that there was presence of voids in some areas, although no significant voids were picked up as a result of this. And it gave us further concerns really regarding the scope of works required and how we try and quantify that for the construction contract. Unknown quantities in construction contracts will in always inherit some risk and concerns regarding price certainty. So to manage that through the construction contract, we proposed that the contractor would undertake more regular coring throughout the whole of the structure and allow a percentage of that coring investigations to be reinstated to get, come up with a provisional sum for the volume of uh, void filling we would have on the sites. So if I can draw a lesson learned from this one, um, I think it would be that undertaking as many concrete investigations and investigations as we could uh, was definitely the right approach to this project. But when you're dealing with work similar to this, you're always going to inherit some risk. And at some point, you're always going to have to pass that through to the construction stage. And for us on this particular contract, use of provisional sums and, and trying to quantify that estimate was a real effective way of us managing that. So if I can just conclude uh, briefly, I could talk about this project for quite a lot longer. Uh, the scheme was completed in 2020 on program and on budget and that was delivered within the context of a global pandemic. So that's a real testament to the excellent performance of the site team in both Knights Brown and the Port Talbot County Borough Council. The minister mentioned earlier today, um, considering whether existing defences were fit for purpose, whether like for like replacement was the best approach or repair was like the best approach uh, and, and the seeking to build back better. And I think Aberavon is a great case study for that. Uh, what we've managed to do through this scheme is future-proof and existing assets to offer a cost-effective and material-effective way of prolonging the life and, and securing that for future generations. So I'd just like to thank Neathport Talbot one last time uh, and thank you all for listening today. Thank you very much, Alec. Um, I was lucky enough to visit the site last year during a SIWEM study day. Uh, we've actually now got um, a few minutes to do some of the questions. There are many questions. I've just selected a few for, for each of the presenters. Um, so kicking off, first of all, um, David, um, if the floor maps aren't recognised by planning and insurance companies, do these organisations still rely on old NAFRA maps? OK, yes, yeah, so thank you. So bit of context, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, most insurance companies were using our mapping products to help with their assessment of premiums. But moving forwards now, we find that very, very few companies actually use our products, probably less than 5%. Um, the private sector, many kind of companies on the call today here um, service these in, uh, insurance companies with their own mapping products. Um, so generally you find insurance companies either use uh, these other mapping products or they use ours essentially. Um, they generally wouldn't use the old NAFRA data set. We are, however, in kind of a consultation with the ABI and Floodree as well about our new mapping products and how we can kind of help uh, service them as well. OK, thank you. Next question. Could you please clarify the areas benefiting? If a defence offers a one in 10 standard of protection, will the areas benefiting extend to the one in 10 uh, flood extent or more widely? Yes, sure. So what we're doing is we're calling these areas benefiting from defences. So 
uh, we have cut these to the extent of the of the low risk area. So they'll basically extend all the way out to the edge of the floodplain. So what we're saying is this area benefits from a defence, but the level of protection will vary significantly uh, within that area because defences can fail and kind of overtop. The, the underlying risk map underneath, uh, that takes into account the standard of protection of the map. So if there is a high level of protection in that area, you'll be shown to be in a kind of a low risk area. But if your standard protection is uh, very small, you know, the, the map underneath will reflect that you're in a high risk area. OK, thank you. Next question. How would you assure the interfaces with the environment agency maps portray the same consistent message across the interface? Yeah, good, uh, good question. Uh, so, uh, you know, we in Wales are obviously different to the EA, um, so we do things slightly differently. Um, but we are trying to kind of get this consistent message uh, of flood risk. So at kind of a higher level, all nations meet on a regular basis um, across the four or five nations. And we're kind of starting to pull together a kind of a technical group now. That's kind of a, a flood uh, mapping level as well. So when um, each of the nations are working on their kind of national uh, flood risk assessment projects, we can try and gain some consistency in those products. So at the moment we have good links, but there's definitely room for improvements uh, for us within NRW to, to help with that consistency. OK, thank you very much, David. I'll now, now turn to Claire. Claire, um, what's what's the biggest challenge for NRW to overcome and how can civil engineers help NRW to overcome this challenge? You would have thought that after months of doing this, we would know about the mute button. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I'd say that this is is not a challenge just for NRW. Um, it's a challenge for all of us, all flood risk management authorities, central government, local government and the, the professional advisors and supporters, uh, many of whom are, are on the line. Um, and that is around um, really sort of starting to get to grips with adaptation and what it means and having those potentially really difficult conversations with communities. And we heard that very good um, presentation around Barmouth earlier. And obviously uh, we have been involved alongside Gwynedd in the conversations around Fairbourne. But I think it is that uh, real challenge um, of, of engaging communities and property owners and in that conversation and as the minister said there are some difficult conversations to be had but it feels as if this is a moment when everything is coming together and we need to use this moment to to really move the conversation and dialogue forward and in terms of what engineers can do um, I think it is, as, as we've heard today, about really exploring the, 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 the real challenges. And we've seen both with Aberavon and Barmouth, the scale of those challenges, the engineering challenge, but also the human challenge. Um, so that would be not a, an NRW alone challenge, but a challenge for all of us. OK, thank you. Um, next question um, is basically challenging an NW a bit. It's saying NRW um, have learnt particularly a lot from the last winter floods, but why couldn't we have learnt that from previous floods um, and the pit review? And um, what steps will we take now to ensure that our staff learn from these um, exceptional floods? Um, I think that's right. We every time we have a major flooding event, we do um, do a rigorous lessons learned. I think what will have come out of my presentation pretty clearly is just the scale of what we faced in February. And this is, I would say, a paradigm shift in in what we collectively need to be thinking about. And I think that uh, you know, Welsh Government in the, in the Minister's um, session 
think there's a real recognition of that now. Okay, thank you. I'll come over to Tom now, if I can. Yep. Tom, the first question is, um, the three to four hours travel time for a filter bed, is this based on calculations or testing? Mm, yeah, that's uh, calculations based on the filter bed depth and the permeability through that bed. OK, thank you. How can we ensure that rain gardens improve water quality? Is it necessary to have minimum size and demonstrate a minimum detention time? What about the risk of mobilising contaminants from within the rain gardens? Um, yes, the, su the sufficient um, treatment within the rain garden. So, yeah, you do need to design those and size them accordingly. Um, yeah, considering your catchment size and to make sure it's going to provide the uh, sufficient amount of treatment. Um, what was the second part of that question? Um, it was about, yeah, what is a risk? What is the risk of mobilising contaminants? For example, particles emitted from vehicles or litter? Uh, I don't really have any particular to add on that, um, other than just following the, the design guidance for SUDS. Uh, so okay. I'm not aware that that's a particular concern. OK, I've got one interesting last question for you. Any views on the benefits of SUDS in greenfield sites such as NRW's forestry coops? Mm, I saw that one on there. Um, mm, I like that one. I, that a forestry coop, I, if I understand correctly, that's where you, the areas where you're managing the felling of trees and that is outside of my area of expertise and experience I don't really know but usually these kind of questions that come up around suds there's all sorts of unusual places where they need you know, where the, the the legislation needs to be applied and just need to come up with some sort of pragmatic approach through discussion with the SAB to find out what's going to be appropriate for that setting I would, I would think. Okay thank you very much I'll come to Alec now. Alec, your question is, how was carbon reduction considered on your projects and did it drive drive decision making, i.e. Car carbon over cost? Um, I think that's a great question and uh, I think it's a uh, indicator of how things have changed over the last uh, three years or so. Um, we, we completed the details of the design of this project back in 2017 and um, the word carbon was mentioned, but it was never mentioned to the degree with which carbon is mentioned now. Um, so design meetings we have now is cost and carbon are synonymous with one another and we, we don't talk about cost without talking about carbon. Um, so carbon was factored into the design of Aberavon, but um, we could uh, argue that it's not as much as uh, we should be talking about it and we are talking about it now. Um, okay. So measures, oh sorry, yeah. Go for it. Okay, just um, Last question now because we've um, got to finish promptly. Uh, okay. What is the expected lifetime of the rock armour protection for this defence? And okay. do, you, do you expect this feature to require significant maintenance over the lifetime of the feature? OK, good. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, the lifetime of the rock armour um, is for 100 years, uh, but we have a disconnect between the existing asset and the um, new protection that's been put in place. Uh, so we've designed the rock armour for 100 years and we anticipate that there'll be only minimal movements of that rock armour within that 100 year period. Um, but there would be the requirement for ongoing maintenance on the existing structure in order to maintain that life uh, for the foreseeable. Um, so the, we anticipate the rock armour would lead, uh, need only minimal maintenance, uh, mainly monitoring and that sort of thing. Uh, but it will be uh, ongoing maintenance required on the concrete structures. OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the questions. I'm really sorry we didn't have time to finish all of them. Um, I will now hand back to um, Yvonne for the concluding marks of the con conference. Thank you. Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, so just to sum up for the day, I've, I've taken a good few notes and I, you can see the theme of how um, we're integrating surface water, rivers and coasts. And uh, I think the one that's kind of stood, stood out for me is how good the surfers have it in West Wales, <laughs> despite all the coastal erosion. 14,000 kilometres of a wave fetch is pretty good. Um, but um, thank you to all of our speakers for contributing today and thank you to George for facilitating us and bringing us all together as our MC. Um, I hope everybody learned something from it and 
Uh, I've seen some good links as well in the chat to further research that we can look into for the next conference as well about um, climate change and weather forecasting. So that would be really good for future events. Um, thank you to uh, my co-chair, Melissa, and uh, thank you to all the delegates. I hear we have about five or 600, so that's pretty good going. Uh, thank you to our sponsors and supporters, as I mentioned earlier, and thank you to the steering group, Keith Jones, George Baker, James Morris, Victoria Greest, uh, Reza Amadian, Robin Campbell, Jeremy Jones, Peter Jones, Jean-Francois Dulong, Melissa Mahaver snow Tim O'Brien and Felicity White. Uh, a recording of the event will appear shortly on the IC and SciWEM websites. Just check the web page for the event as you booked in and you should be able to find it there. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, there you go. Thank you all.